Hello, Play the Game family. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. This episode of PTG is brought to you by our favorite tax man, Mr. David Roquet. And uh, guess what time of year it is? It is tax season, everyone's favorite. Uh, and we know it can be stressful, a little bit daunting and intimidating if you are not using someone like David. You need someone on your team that gets your unique situations and how to get you the most for everything that you have worked so hard for all year. And having someone like David that you're not intimidated to ask questions or talk to is absolutely imperative. He is going to help you maximize your returns in an efficient way during these crazy times. And David is an accountant and paintball player from South Florida with over six years of personal and corporate tax experience. He has clients throughout the United States, so it doesn't matter what state you're in. He knows the legislation and is always willing to go the extra mile for his customers so that you feel good about the process and know that you are in good hands. All of David's filings are done with the highest integrity and due diligence, and working with him personally has been a truly excellent experience, and we are so happy to have him on board with PTG. He does all Play the Games filings and is a great dude to work with. Somewhat unique situation with Marcelo and myself. I'm in Arizona. Marcelo is in Cali, um, but he has been able to help us jump through all the hoops and has been really easy to work with and fun to work with. So if you need someone in your quarter for tax season, David Roque is your man. Hit him up on the uh, email at D-R-O-Q-U-E. 954 at gmail.com and he is with D Roque Accounting. Once again, his email D R O Q U E 954 at gmail.com. This episode is brought to you by Lone Wolf Paintball. They are an online supplier and have been around since the beginning of the game as Michigan's premier paintball field and paintball supplier since 1987. They are rapidly expanding into the online retail space and supplying everything you need for paintball and to just have a great time out there at your local paintball fields. Um, they are amazing for the paintball community and they have got it all for you. Go to lonewolfpaintball.com to get any of your favorite brands and uh, head over there and take a quick surf on the Lone Wolf Paintball Wave at lonewolfpaintball.com. They have what you need at a great price and they boast amazing customer service and same day shipping, which is outstanding because it's always nice to order something and know it's on its way immediately. So go ahead, give them a look, check out their YouTube, uh, their Instagram. The Instagram name is Lone Wolf PB. YouTube is Lone Wolf Paintball. And uh, keep up to date with deals, sales, and content. Uh, PTG is absolutely honored to have them on board. So head over to LoneWolfPaintball.com and become a part of their community. PTG is brought to you by Heel Brand CBD. They are a CBD powerhouse making a huge splash in the paintball industry in 2021 and beyond. Be on the lookout for them at NXL events and everywhere in between. Uh, CBD is an absolute staple in my healing process and they are helping out so many people. They want to heal the world and we want to help them along on their mission to do that. They create the highest quality CBD products you've ever seen. And I know because I've been using them for quite some time. Um, they have amazing stuff like nanotechnology, which I only recently learned about, which is pretty spectacular. It is taking that large CBD particle. And what Heal Brand is doing is breaking that down into microscopic greatness with their process, which will allow for the particles of CBD to pass through your cell wall more quickly and more efficiently. As opposed to normal CBD, it could take some time before you start to feel the effects. With nanotechnology, you feel the effects immediately because that particle is getting through those cell walls with more efficiency and able to go to work quicker. Uh, people are using this stuff for inflammation, anxiety, and also as a sleep aid. Heal Brand has an amazing knockout shot that you have to check out. Um, you got to head over to the website and check out all these amazing products for your pets, for yourself, for recovery, and just for feeling better in life. They have a wide variety of benefits that CBD can provide. And my favorite that they have is the cool down cream. They have a cool down cream that I use for soreness and recovery after getting shot up with paintballs and I'm all bruised. It's nice to rub that stuff on there. And then also if you strain a muscle, it really helps with loosening it up and making it feel great. 
So head over to healbrand.com, H-E-A-L-B-R-A-N-D.com. Use code PLAYTHEGAME and you will get 10% off of your orders. That is exclusively for the Play the Game family. We are so appreciative of everybody supporting us and supporting the sponsors. So head over and give Heal Brand a look. Play the Game podcast is brought to you by Transfuse. Transfuse is the greatest electrolyte formula in the universe. It is amazing. You need to have this stuff in your kitchen. You need to have it in your car, in your bag. If you're traveling, just have it around because it is going to save you. It is going to be that boost that you need to keep you going strong into your day and into a tournament for paintball. We absolutely love it, and we've been using it religiously for over a year. Dynasty has been trying it out. We've been passing it out to all the guys, and the proof is in the pudding. It has been working. Practices are able to last longer because we can play longer. The tournaments have been obviously going well. We won World Cup, and we were using Transfuse out there. It is easy. It's portable. It's delicious. It's nutritious. It's everything that you need in your life, and you need to give it a try. Top pros are using it. They're at all the NXL events, and... Obviously, if these top tier athletes are using it to be the best version of themselves, you should probably give it a look. Um, It has magnesium, potassium, and sodium to keep you hydrated. It has zinc, vitamin C, vitamin B, and choline to give you a cognitive and immunity boost. And it is delicious. (laughs) It is just good stuff. You're going to absolutely love this stuff. So I want you to try it. Tell us what you think. Give us a message. Tropical Bliss is my favorite, so maybe give that one a look. Um, They're going to be doing a lot of big things in 2021, so stay tuned for Transfuse and some of the big developments that they have. Don't be dehydrated. Use Transfuse. Um, Go to translabs.com, T-R-A-N-Z-L-A-B-S.com. Use code PLAYTHEGAME and you'll get 10% off. If you subscribe to a monthly service, you'll get an additional 11% off, so you could potentially take advantage of 21% off on Transfuse. Do not sleep on this stuff. Give it a look and enjoy. What's going on, PTG fam? Thank you guys so much for tuning into the show. This episode is really special. One of my longtime friends, old teammates, Derek Janish, uh, played on Aftermath with me, played on Die Kids, my very first team, and then went and pursued a path to become a Navy SEAL. He is um, decorated as a Navy SEAL. Uh, He's got the heroic um, achievement as an automatic weapons gunner and um, really has been through a lot uh, in his his life and in his adventure as a Navy SEAL and his mindset and um, and, uh, outlook on the way to live life and the way to succeed and the way to go about your everyday business is really second to none. So this was this was a really good one. It was really special. It was really uh, different, unique, and we're very fortunate. We're very thankful that Derek came on and was open with, with the Play the Game podcast listeners and shared some very uh, insightful stories into you know some of the stuff that, that he had gone through and overcame, and um, the, the mindset that he has now is just so spectacular that he could go through all of that and come out the type of person that he is now, and um, that's no uh, that, that's not without understanding the the work and dedication he has put into being the best version of himself so anyway without further ado we're gonna hop in the show we'll see you soon that was an insane inside move by marcelo margot great communication and the crowd starts chanting harman great great shot by all the guys though tyler harman saved that game came out with two wins marcelo margot was on fire Derek Janish, my friend, longtime teammate, old Aftermath player, more importantly, a very accomplished Navy SEAL, um, very decorated and, uh, and much deserved, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. How you doing, brother? Dude, honored to be here. And we've talked about it, talked to Tyler, like, so yeah. for you guys and happy to be a part of this. Thank you, bro. And, and we're honored to have you on here to tell your stories of uh, just the amazing person that you are i mean all around you've you've done a lot in paintball and in real life and we're excited to share these stories and and talk about how amazing paintball has been in your life and all of our lives so thank you so much man 100 percent appreciate you guys and um you know i i watched a lot of your episodes pretty much all of them i think 
Yeah, and uh, fortunate to say, I got a, I got a shout out from him, man. I appreciate that. Obviously, we got to give hey. him in a shout out. Yep. Got to give Bob Long a shout out. <laughs> yes. Like literally, when I watch your guys' shows, each one of them, I, at some point, you know, through West Coast Paintball or through NXLs, I probably had a significant interaction or just something that like I took away from literally like every person on your show. So I appreciate wow. it as well because to me, you guys are like paintball historians now, just documenting <laughs> these legends of the game. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who else? Who else? gets them in that format where you let them kind of like tell their story and just get it all out there. Yeah. Awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what we're going for with this show. You know, it's, it's been fun for us because obviously we're fans too. We're huge fans of of everyone that we do have on the show. So, um, you know, it's, it's a cool way to compartmentalize as well. You know, growing up in paintball, you, you're such a fan of the game. And then when you, when you get to the pro division and you're trying to compete, some of that gets removed because you, you have to remove it. You know, it's a, it's mm-hmm. like that whole, your idols becoming rivals kind of thing. You have to be able to remove it. So the show's actually been a really cool way to bring that, that, you know, inner, that younger fan that, you know, we grew up sure. as kind of back. Um, so it's yeah. been cool, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm really stoked that you've been enjoying it. And 100%. And real quick, I mean, dude, you were on the path to be pro as well, man. You know, uh, you, you ended up, uh, you know, repositioning and, and changing your career path and went and accomplished some, some insane things that I'm very excited to talk to you about, but uh, you were definitely on that path and we'll, we'll get into that as well. Cause you um, even in your career in paintball, were very accomplished. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. For me, it was always either pro paintballer or Navy seal. I really had no backup plan. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, as kids, like the paintball thing sounded funny and the Navy seal thing sounded like a stretch. But like each day, each practice, each tournament, like both those dreams became more and more of a reality until yeah. like I literally had to choose. I don't know if you remember, Marcel, there was a San Diego event. Uh, we won it. We put two teams in. We took first and yeah. third in. We took first in whatever the semi-pro division was and then third in D2. Yeah. And I left for boot camp the following weekend. Mm-hmm. Wow. Was Where that exactly? 2000... Was that 2008? It was 2005. No. 2005. 2005. Yeah. We, we played semi-pro with aftermath i think it was i think it was d1 it was d1 seven yeah man, which th- essentially was i thought we went d1 in 2006 weren't we d3 in 05 or did we finish the year we, in d1 we finished the year in d1 for seven dude men. oh that's crazy yeah. so we won two d1 tournaments in a row with aftermath 05 and 06 tampa the very first seven man yeah because remember we picked up rory and uh whisper right at the end of the year dude you're right man yeah oh. shout out to whisper Whip. Whisper. <laughs> I hope he's yeah. watching. I love him. And uh, they call him Wizard, too. The old wizard. The old, the old wizard. <laughs> yeah. He's got many, many nicknames. Dude. He does. <laughs> Moose. <For sure. laughs> and like I said, uh, first time playing, not a birthday party. I'm pretty excited to tell the story. <laughs> and and I got I to gotta give a shout out to he's Giovanni. Not even, he's not even going to let us ask. He already knows the drill. <laughs> yeah, he's oh, like... right, come, on. come on, bro. I got your script down. Come on. <laughs> I don't know if you guys remember, but I like I got to give the shout out to Giovanni for the marketing. There was this mm-hmm. there was this brochure in like every sports you'd go to like Chicks or Dicks or whatever sports chalet. There was like yeah. paintball and this like this big buff dude that looks like Rambo with a paintball gun and then SC Village. And I'm like, yeah, that's sorry. what I want to do. I'm like, because it's, <laughs> oh, wow. it's like river rafting, like rock climbing yeah. or paintball. And I'm like, I want to go play paintball. So I remember running with that flyer to my dad. Yeah. Like, dad, I want to go to SC Village. Like, had no clue what it was, had no gear. Had all I knew was that like big buff dudes that like wanted to be soldiers played paintball. So that's what I needed to be doing. <laughs> oh, what year was, was this? Man, what year? I was probably all right. I started high school in 2001. This was mm-hmm. probably 98. Okay. Awesome. Probably 98. I remember like, I remember the 98 cockers still being right feed. And I remember when vert feed was like a big deal for the auto cocker. Like when it was yes. standard on like the STO and the black magic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause I always hated the elbow. I thought it was retarded. I'm like, uh, yeah. I have this like $400 paintball gun. And then this like little piece of plastic that keeps breaking. I'm like, mm-hmm. why don't they just make it vert feed? Yep. And now I had I, one I of got, those too. And then you watch the your guys' Bob Long episode, and he explains that he's like, "Yeah, Budor thought they wouldn't sell, and, <laughs> and now they like sound like hotcakes." That was crazy talking to Bob about that. Like all, just like even like he's like, uh, "Yeah, I invented the pack too." You know, I just invented <laughs> yeah. the harness that everybody <laughs> yeah. wears. Now. Oh, oh, by the way, yeah, that thing that you carry all your paintballs on in the back. Yeah, yeah I, I was like, that. "You got to be kidding me." <laughs> One of my I, favorite I, I Bob no Long about that. Yeah. One of my favorite Bob Long stories I got to tell. 
yeah. from Naughty by Nature, right? We were sponsored by Naughty or by Bob Long. We had those green aliases. I don't know if you I guys remember. remember. I we were the only those. people that had them. Yeah. They were sick. Yeah. And I was actually little... in the shop when they were getting built. You know, I was oh, watching nice. all the guns run through and I was building my dragon up. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I'm, I'm 16 years old playing for Naughty by Nature. We're playing 10 man pro am. Uh, we're sponsored by Monster Energy, which is terrible for a 16 year old to be sponsored <laughs> by, by Monster. We, we literally used to get pallets of Monster Energy sent to us, Whoa. like pal not, not cases, but complete pallets of like whatever the new flavor was. And they're like, go crazy with it. So there like, I'm drinking, I'm drinking no water. I'm drinking a monster in between each game and just like, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> wired, wired as he can be. Anyways, my, uh, to back up on the story, we were also sponsored by Hybrid, which was, I want to say Little John and whoever that was. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, we're just I think, talking about this. Yeah. So he had Hybrid, right? Yes. And, John, and I yeah. upgraded my gun with all these hybrid parts, right? The volumizer, the ASA, like everything yeah. high, high covers, you know, and it stops shooting like the way I wanted to. I bring it over to Bob Long, who, who literally used to gun tech at the events. If Bob wasn't yeah. playing, he was sitting there gun tech and guns. He looks yeah. at my gun. He's like, come back in like 15 minutes. And I'm like, all right. I come back. He had taken all the hybrid parts off, stripped it back down to just, <laughs> <laughs> just to how Bob designed it. And he's like, don't mess with the gun again. And like, I never, I never, I never messed with that alias again. That's crazy. Shot great. That's hilarious. Because L- yeah. LJ was probably on the team, you know, with the assassins, like around that same time, I would imagine. It was, or that, or he was just about to go to Legacy. I don't know if you remember that oh, period yeah. of yeah. LJ's career. Yes. But, um, I mean, dude, I lived and breathed at SC Village. So if you were a pro at SC Village, when I was like 15, 16, I was, I was looking at your gear, what jersey you're wearing, all that, dude. I was, I was steady in every pro. How awesome, man, to be able to grow up down there in that time with all those amazing paintball characters running around. You know, you get to see the best players in the world down there. 100%. And yeah. uh, homeboy Riley, who I hope yep. is doing well. Sullivan. He is. He's Sullivan. doing a lot better. He, he got banged up, but he's doing all right. He was definitely one of the uh, the street ball gangsters of SC Village as well. Yep. <laughs> it was a, it was a whole vibe, and I know Marcelo remembers. Mm-hmm. It was like you were either gonna like become a pro paintball player or get in a fight or just hate the sport <laughs> and leave. You know, like I was uh, there weren't a lot of options. You know. Yeah. Yeah, SC Village, man. During that era, was was absolutely the mecca. You know, it was it was it was so exciting to drive. I you know coming from San Diego, drive an hour and a half up there Saturday morning, hour and a half back an hour and a half back up Sunday morning, hour and a half back every single weekend. Cause it was the cool place to be. You know, it was, it was where all the pros were. Anyone who wanted to be a pro was there. Anyone who wanted to do anything in the sport was there. You know, that's, that's yeah. what it was about. Facts. Yeah. yeah you got to have a, a hub center, man. That's where all the talent comes out of right now. I feel like Texas kind of has it, you know, and, that's why uh, I keep, that's why I keep hearing paintball fit is the spot. Yeah. 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 It's um, Texas. Uh, not just paintball fit you also have obviously x factors park which does very well has a lot of talent mm-hmm. out there as well so you have two you know texas is obviously a big state um you have two very successful fields with two you know top pro teams ac is going to struggle a little bit but i think ac diesel is actually going to kind of replace that ac dallas role to be completely honest i think they're gonna they're gonna be really good um, i agree yeah so yeah. you know there's there's a lot going on there in texas for sure florida obviously is a nice hub but i think we're bringing it back here in southern california yeah. mike's getting active fran's running nice. an awesome park at victory fran and nikki are, are crushing it that field has been, has been packed the last couple times that i've went it's absolutely packed all four fields are turf it's nice um it's well ran and there's mm-hmm. a lot of talent coming up in southern california again too so um and you also see the pros are out there which that is that's what creates the vibe. You know, there was like a a period where, yeah, you know, there's a period where the pros, if they're not practicing with their team, they weren't going to the fields. And I think last year, 2020, um, because we didn't have much going on. So many pros were out at the local fields and in Southern California, you started seeing that a lot. All the pros Mm -hmm. are out at the fields every weekend, just kind of playing with all the divisional teams. And that's, that's that's what it's about. Cali as a whole is doing really well, you know, yeah. with paintball, um, NorCal, SoCal, the whole state is crushing it. So I think Cali and obviously Texas, those are the big hubs and, and Florida, of course. Um, and there's some East coast, uh, ballers out there as well, you know, but, um, yeah, Cali and Texas right now for sure. Well, it makes it, it makes it tangible, right? When you see your heroes at the field and yeah. you're like, okay, he practices here. This is where I practice. Yeah. It's a lot easier to connect the dots to pro. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you see what they're doing too, you know? You see exactly how they're playing, how they're how they're attacking their practices and, and get all the details on what they're really doing. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I feel like growing up, that was a big part of it is seeing the pros at the field every weekend. It was so just exactly like you said, Derek, it was so easy to look at them and say, that's what I want to do. And I can do it. I'm, I'm here doing the same stuff they're doing, you know, at a, at a much lower level, but okay, mm-hmm. this is, that's what I want to be, you know, whereas if, if they were never at my local field, I don't know, maybe it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have idolized these guys. I wouldn't have, you know, as, aspired to be like them, you know, and I don't know. I don't know yeah. if, if passion alone or just love of the game alone without seeing that yeah. kind of thing and having role models in the game. I don't know if it would have driven me as far as it did. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, Makes sense. I agree. I wonder now, so now that you're at, you know, the top of your game, you won world cup, who do you guys look to as other athletes to like inspire you to train harder, work harder? I mean, other mm-hmm. sports or just. I'll, I'll take that first. Uh, for me personally, I'm legitimately inspired from so many different avenues um, outside of paintball, obviously from inside of paintball as well, but like just, just my children, you know, my, my children, my wife, um, uh, other athletes, of course, in different fields of their work, um, different, different art forms, different um, trends, and just staying on the pulse of what's going on in society and, and like just being inspired for humanity to, to make this world worthy of our kids, because that's really what it's all about. We need to make this place worthy of the future. And um, that kind of stuff is what really gets me fired up and and ready to attack, you know? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, uh, I feel the same. I I pull inspiration from from a ton of different sectors. You know, it's um, inside paintball, outside of paintball, people that are successful in anything and people that have to overcome hardship and sacrifice and and things that you can relate to. Um, I don't really discriminate as far as what I will pull inspiration from. And mm-hmm. I think that comes from being inspired uh, from within first. When you're truly inspired from within, you learn to be able to pull inspiration from anything, you know? Um, and and it's, a, it's a really powerful tool actually, because you don't need you know one person to follow or to look to. You, you find a way to find inspiration in anything that you look at. Uh, mm-hmm. a- anyone that you want to, to admire that is doing well in what they're doing, you can, you can take bits and pieces of what they do and make it your own and, and help it help you, you know, um, that's mm-hmm. something that I think I've done pretty much my whole life, you know, whether it's with martial arts or basketball or paintball or, or wh- whatever it might be, there's just inspiration coming from so many different sectors, you know, and, you know, it's funny, we talked about this a little bit before the show, Derek, but I think, almost everything that I'm inspired by relates to the mindset of the individual, much less the act of the individual. So again, if you're, if you're an artist or basketball player business, that's not quite what I'm inspired by. It's more the mindset and the grit that it takes to achieve what you're achieving. Right. Right. And how could I forget nature? Oh my God. Nature inspires me. Like when I look at the moon (laughs) and the sun and the wind and like nature is one of the most inspiring things in my life. Absolutely. You, you didn't forget nature's just always with you, Ty. So yeah, it was, yeah. It was said <laughs> without being said. <laughs> yeah. Nature for sure. Um, I was just a modern shaman trapped in a paintballer's body. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Man, I've been sent here from, uh, from some distant planet or something. Um, I want to pick your brain on aftermath and, and what that was like being a part of that camp and kind of bring us through you know, when the door first opened to the camp and how you got introduced to it and kind of walk us through that whole program. And then, and then we'll, we'll move on in the lineage of everything. Cause you have some really powerful things to talk about and we want to get to that. Yeah. I, I just want to interject. I mean, he got a spot on aftermath because I gave him a chance on die kids, you know, <laughs> before aftermath. And so he, got his, <laughs> he had his time Couldn't to shine. <laughs> Couldn't wait for it. <laughs> so Tyler, when I first got on Aftermath, I had to try out, right? Just like yeah. everybody else, except for these yeah. two kids kind of already had a spot on their team and their names were <laughs> Alex Goldman and Marcelo Margot. And uh, I got a phone call from Alex and he said, Hey, there's this new team. Mike Hinman is coaching it. Uh, I think you're going to be a really good fit for it. You should come out and try out. He's like, whatever you got going on, just come out and try out. And this, so in my paintball lineage already, all right. And Mouse said, you got to mention this, so I'm getting it. I started off just playing woods ball, right? Just going to SC mm-hmm. Village, convinced I was the best kid at woods ball, right? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, you do all, you play Iraq, you play Beirut, which, like I said, back then, it was, it was amazing. You literally, yeah. we had the best field in the world, and there was, like, there was active duty military there, there was pro players, like, 
you had such a diverse group of people playing paintball together. And I'm just a 12 year old kid, like just part of it all, you know, just in the mix, just running as fast as I could to try and shoot somebody. Cause one of my things, my uncle actually told me, my uncle, Tony, he said, no matter how you do in sports, right. Whether you're the best or the worst, you can always hustle. You can always hustle. Yeah. Like that's always in your tool bag. So hustle. So I would just run as fast as I could to a 50 and try and shoot one guy. And I did that enough times where people on teams were like, Hey, you know, come play this tournament with us. Yeah. So it that means involved- so much. That means so much. The hustle and the, you know, that means a lot to an organization. Absolutely. So yeah. that evolved to like what we called street ball, right? So all at the end of the day, you'd go play like hyperball fields after you did all your walk-ons, right? So you'd get like Lego land. We had the, the double wall field, the rocket field. And every weekend, you'd see these guys there. You'd see Dynasty there. You'd see Bushwhackers. You'd see Avalanche. You'd see Infamous. It was insane. Like, it literally was like a pro tournament on any given Sunday. And, like, just these guys shooting with their Intimidators or Angels, like, 10 (laughs) paws on their back. I was, I could barely afford, you know, like, five pods for the whole day. So seeing one dude with 12 pods in one game just blew my mind. I was like, I was like, I was like, no, I was a kid that was like, no wonder he's pro. All he does is just sit there and shoot his, his Bob Long machine gun a million miles an hour, you know? Yeah. So OC Kids was, was really like my first serious paintball team. And this was alongside Die Kids. That's why I laugh at Marcelo because we were, we were competitors. <laughs> Not we had- really. You guys, you guys were the cooler, better team for sure. Oh, you guys thank were, you. You guys, were divi- you guys were a division above us. What do you mean, dude? Yeah. Just, right. you, know, you realize where the future was. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> and uh, so we had we had B Short, who's nasty. Yeah. And if Ooh, you don't know B Short's yeah. origin story, B yeah. Short literally went from playing five man rookie to pro. He skipped every division. I don't <laughs> yeah. think, I don't truthfully, I don't think he even played a national event until he was on Ironman. Yeah, that's like, we, nuts. Oh, we were literally playing Cal Jam with B Short as he's trying out for Ironman, and in the middle of our first game on the uh, the double wall field, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. I, I, I dive into my bunker. I'm all tired. I pull up to shoot the first guy and the ref is like waving at me, like, stop shooting, stop shooting. I thought somebody got hurt. I'm like, what happened? And then I see Brandon hanging the flag. <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're, like, they're like, well, Brandon ran through the center and literally shot, literally shot everyone. everyone. Shot yeah. Everyone. Not, that's not an exaggeration. Wow. It's he shot all five people and hung the flag in probably 10 seconds. That kid is a gift to the paintball game. It's a, it's, a tragedy that he's not playing anymore because of how good he is at paintball. We called him on Dynasty. We called him the surgeon. That was his nickname. Yeah, he's just surgical and his moves are meticulous. He'll, he'll just take you down and he's just, he doesn't miss, you know, he's be short. No, and I mean, yeah. he used to talk. Like I said, I would pick everybody's brain. He was my teammate. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, what do you think makes you so much better? And you know, he told me of all things karate. And you can ask short. He said his karate stance. See? For like, but having that like low center of gravity and those yeah. quick feet and then being able to yeah. keep your upper body like uh dynamic i guess is the right word i've been i've been preaching this non-stop martial arts and paintball go hand in hand right. <laughs> me too i've been giving yeah. a lot of love back to you know my taekwondo days that's right taekwondo nice yeah. i claim uh muay thai and like jkd but yeah that was that was my nice. background in martial arts as well Nice. Yeah, because when I grew up, all my uh, teammates on Twisted were a part of a dojo um, from Dynamic nice. mix, Mixed Martial Arts in Modesto, California. Um, and the the fighting style, it does. It goes hand in hand with paintball. Absolutely. I mean, in my opinion, if you're doing it at the top level and you're like participating in yoga and you're one of the paintballers that like does a proper warm up, paintball mm-hmm. essentially is a martial art. It's, yeah. it's not much different than the concept of Bushido or whatever else if you're treating it that way Mm -hmm. deep that's really deep i like that yeah you're definitely on to something there and so yeah uh, if you're a paintball player and you want to get better do a little martial arts as well it'll really get you in shape and and get you in it's the postures too you take those same postures right snap shooting 100 percent. a snap shot Mm -hmm. and a karate chop i don't think are really that much different fundamentally if you have that strong base of your legs you know Mm -hmm. i i think um a a big thing as well as the discipline it teaches you mixed martial Mm -hmm. arts really have a way of teaching you about discipline and respect and and just um for me taekwondo was kind of the foundation of of you know my mindset moving forward you know and like Mm -hmm. the the discipline it took to learn technique um and how difficult it was, was something that I feel like I've carried with me w- with pretty much anything that I've done. I, you know, I'll mm-hmm. definitely put, you know, when I finally have kids, they're going to be in some sort of mixed martial arts. 
Yeah. 100%. Absolutely. I, I think jujitsu is probably the best and not just for, I was just talking to somebody else about this as well. Jujitsu gives you that confidence in life where, you know, you can handle yourself in a dangerous situation or a stressful sure. situation and you can make mistakes on the mats where in real life, you don't get those opportunities and make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to pick your brain before we go into the aftermath and like get really into the camp. What was it like growing up with mouse? You got to, you got uh, to essentially grow up with him. The best, the best. We were, we were friends before we even played paintball together. Wow. So that's crazy. I lived in Mission Viejo right by Lake Mission Viejo. I don't know if you guys know where that is, I do. but Alex, Alex lived up the street from me, literally walking distance. Uh, we had a mutual best friend. His best friend was the younger brother of my best friend. So that's how we met. We started playing Counter-Strike together. We started going to the lake together or whatever. And then one day uh, we were already playing paintball. Me and Jared, who's Zach's older brother, we're already playing paintball. And then for Zach's birthday, Alex went with them. So Alex's first time playing was a birthday party that I was at as the older kid who was showing these kids <laughs> kind of like how to actually play paintball. Oh, so we already have the scoop on Alex's first, uh, first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if so facto, I taught Alex everything he knows. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> Legend. If you didn't see that set up, that's where I was going with that. <laughs> so, sounds accurate to me. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. makes total sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome. And Marcelo learned by, we didn't, we didn't compete against each other a lot, Marcelo. I truthfully remember we didn't. Velocity Paintball. And like I said, the hot dogs. I remember it was either yeah. your uncle or your dad. Somebody was, my was, dad. Working the hot, yeah. was working the hot dog vendor. And I uh -huh. knew if I practice that velocity, I got free hot dogs along with practice. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, you told me that's the only reason he came to die kids because my dad owned the hot dogs. That was it, dude. You, hey, same he also, he also had about. hamburgers, you know, it makes sense. There's some really good hamburgers um, out there. Hot dogs. I specifically remember some like bratwurst, some like wrapped some bratwurst like, too. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were yeah. fancy. Uh -huh. He was not playing games. No, he your dad was not yeah. playing. He had, he had the food cart on lock out there. This yeah. was like, yeah. you know, my dad had owned so many businesses, did so many different things. This was, he went through a really gnarly uh, liver replacement surgery. Um, was in the hospital for like three months, and uh, his recovery was was very glim. But he pulled through and was, I think he was like. 65 years old at the time and decided, you know, once he got healthy, he said, you know, I'm going to start another business. And everyone's like, no, what are you doing? Don't do that. Why are you going to start? Don't start any business right now. You know, you need to get better. I was like, I'm going to start a food catering business. You yeah, know? why not? Dude, that was just his mentality. Always. He was always uh, until the day he passed, he was like in his hospital bed, truly trying to figure out ways to work. Like dad, yeah. put the phone down, you know, <laughs> you're okay. Oh. Just relax a little bit, but it's just his mindset. Yeah. He's the Italian getter. hustle. A hundred percent. 100%. Go get her. Yeah. Love that. So back back to Goldman. Really, it was Counter-Strike. Counter-Strike, paintball. And then it was weird because, like I said, he was on Aftermath before me. And I don't know if you played that event, Marcelo, but you guys played one seven-man event where you had blue JT jerseys. I was not this? on the team yet, no. So either was I. The they first were, they one were I played. Th there were Thunder Kids at that time. Really? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So then I played the next event before Pomona. We played one, like, seven-man. We won that, too. Go figure. There we go. <laughs> Dominate. Literally, we literally won everything that year except one uh, one event at Pittsburgh, which I went back and looked at the uh, APPA, and Marcelo missed that event for whatever reason. So the only event Aftermath didn't win our first year as a team was the one event that Marcelo missed. So I got to give him that <laughs> shout out. Yeah, that's that's a, that's that's a huge shout out. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> such a such a pansy that I missed that one. I hate myself. The kid knows how to win. Yeah. you know it was a family thing or something it you, was you had a yeah. Pretty good, yeah. yeah yeah i had a family thing i was a kid i was like 13 maybe 14 years old you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. had stuff i had to do so mars dude this is for you i have a question like there's a ton of people that don't understand that there's a there's a science to winning you know what i'm saying um what would be like your best advice because you've won a lot at the highest level at the divisional level all levels what's some advice on just winning man I mean, you getting it done, you, have, you know, you have to do it. I, I truly think it it's confidence, but that comes from preparation. I think in mm -hmm. anything I've ever done, I mean, I won black belt tournaments in Taekwondo, you know, and it was because I train every single day, all day. It's all I think about, you know, so whatever I'm doing, I, I put all of my time and energy into it. And when you yeah. show up to actually perform, it's easy. 
I, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's the best. It's preparation. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really not difficult. It's not a, a weird thing to understand. I mean, Derek, I'm sure you can attest this as well. It's all about the prep, you know, it's all about the preparation. If you put in the time, um, you, you understand what it takes to win when you get, get to that stage. Like you've, you've done mm -hmm. it so many times. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, Derek absolutely understands that it's about preparation. That that's what it's all about. And I'm sure aftermath taught you a lot about preparation, right? Yeah, for sure. And that was, uh, probably what I appreciated the most about Mike was, um, and I was thinking about this as well. You could almost tell the difference between a pro pro team and a divisional team, just by looking at their pits. If you, mm -hmm. if I just took pictures of two pits and said, which one's pro, and which one's divisional, I'm pretty sure both of you would be like, that's the pro pit and that's the divisional pit. And you'd be like, why? And it comes down to efficiency and organization. In the SEAL teams, we have the same thing. Every, every, every mission you do before you even go on, it's, you know, it's team gear, buddy gear, and then personal gear, meaning your vehicles are prepped, your buddy is all squared away, his radio is good, he's got crypto, he's got all of his P's and Q's. And then you literally, even as a grown man who's already been to war, you get a buddy check. You say, hey, man, how, how do I look? Like, do I got mm -hmm. everything I need for the mission? Do I got my radio? Do I got my mags jammed? Do I got, you know, is my gun lube? Do I have extra lube in case this goes down? I, I, one of the, the cool things about the SEAL teams is it's such, such a like amazing gathering of men for mental toughness and just professionalism. I truly do not know if there is like a more unique group of athletes that are that professional where literally every time you step out the wire, somebody's life is on the line. There's, mm -hmm. there's just no other way to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God bless all you guys, man. And thank you to everybody out there. If you're in the armed forces or any any part of you know the armed forces god bless you guys because it is it is hard work and it's uh you know it's kind of a thankless job almost too where you, you know we need to be we need to be praising the, the fact that you guys all are out there keeping us safe honestly um there's so much going on on the back end that uh, we need to really be grateful for you know yeah it's 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 a strange thing because it's um it is a thankless job, but it, I mean, it's kind of like you guys, when you're competing at the highest level, like uh, most of the guys that are there, they're going to be there either way. They're going to be yeah. there, whether they're getting the pat on the back or not. Mm -hmm. um, what it comes down to too, is I would say just taking care of veterans when they get back, especially ones that are struggling with PTSD or unemployment mm -hmm. or, you know, just issues with their family. Cause it's, yeah. it's not easy to be that, that warrior and then just come home and like turn it all off and then be just a normal member in society. It's for me, I, yeah. I personally had tons of issues going through that, like through divorce and breaking up with girlfriends. I just mm -hmm. did not know how to switch my brain from like, all right, there's no fire. If that, if that makes sense to you guys. Yeah. Well, my, my dad um, actually saw a live action as well. He was an army ranger, uh, airborne infantry and um, yeah, God bless you guys, man. Um, and he, you know, has been through a lot as well. And, and the, uh, I think the thing that helps him the most is just having great people around, obviously, like, you know, um, his wife and his family and, and just anybody, anybody that can open their heart to you, you know, and like you said, like actually care about these people who are laying it all out on the line out there and, um, you know, opening our arms and being there and being hyper receptive to the types of things that they have been through because it's no joke man when you step outside of these borders this world is nuts it is crazy crazy and we're so fortunate to be in america and i think that that is kind of something that is lost here um you know because there, we have no context we only see what we see on the tv on the phones and and i'm gonna be blunt that's all controlled um that is that's you know <laughs> that that's programmed we are we have programs that are, are out there and and we need to you know be just very very mindful of of uh how special our forces are and how much they mean to us and and how i mean truly special they are for our safety in this world because it like i said you go outside of these borders it's a whole nother world out there yeah for sure and you know i saw that and it was i definitely grew up in the bubble of orange county and grew up in just like that paintball lifestyle. And it was always awkward for me because where I grew up was, it was really privileged. I, we had, it was a choice for me. Like I really wanted to be a SEAL. It wasn't yeah. like I didn't have other options in life. I knew that's what I wanted to do. I knew it was going to be hard. I knew I was going to travel. 
And when you see some of these third world countries and how specifically men treat other women in the world, it just, it didn't sit right with me. And I knew that we were doing quote unquote God's work or I knew our mission was, it was a good mission. I was, I was proud to be a part of it to say the least. And I don't want to get too political on here. I'd like to keep it more just like yeah. on that, that mentality of what it took to get there. Cause like I said, there's still, there's more people coming behind us. You know, there's, there's mm -hmm. more guys that are going down range still, mm -hmm. and there's going to be more conflicts. It's kind of inevitable in our society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, Derek. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. It is something that is inevitable and uh, it, it takes a lot of bravery and a lot of, um, you know, we talk about grit a lot. I, it's almost, uh, it's almost an understatement, you know, yeah. in, in, in what, what, uh, what you guys, it, men and women have to go through to serve the country. I would like to talk about, about the whole process of becoming a Navy SEAL. Um, I think it's understood by many how difficult that is, the type of training and, and how, I mean, you are an elite kind of individual if you can actually go all the way through and make it to become a, a Navy SEAL. It's, it's one of the hardest things to do um, in our country. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess maybe before we get to that, we have a little bit more of the paintball story to kind of dive into that leads up to that, right? But uh, that's something I'm very interested in, for sure. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's like the two parts of my personality is like the goofy paintballer and then the guy that's also a free fall jump master and a sniper. Like I've always kind of had both those mindsets in my body. And um, yeah, yeah, it's, but the thing that ties them together, like we already talked about, and I've heard you say on this podcast a few times, Marcelo, is just knowing how to win and experience winning. I 100%. One of the sayings that buds is literally it pays to be a winner. And that is one of the few places in life where you get instant gratification from winning a race or winning an evolution, doing more pushups than the guy next to you. You're going to get instant results and you're going to get instant feedback from your instructors. They want to see you take that guy's soul next to you and yeah. like just be better. And the thing that makes Bud so crazy and so intense is everybody there is a stud. It's like you have dudes from all over the country who are division one athlete. We had Olympic caliber swimmers. We had, you know, championship wrestlers in my Bud's class, like NCAA champion wrestlers. And I was just Derek from paintball, literally the only quote unquote paintballer there. But what I truly think I had that set me apart was just this grit and determination where I was like, I'm either going to die in training or I'm going to make it through this program. And some days, not to like, you know, make little of death, but I was like, maybe it'll just be easier if I die because I won't have to do push-ups and run anymore. You know, <laughs> like how my, my family tell my story. Like Derek, <laughs> Derek, his heart exploded on a run, you know, like you can't take anything away from that. But I would wake up every day sore as heck. And I just be like, all right, I guess I'm doing this again, you know, because I told myself I'm not going to quit. So you're yeah. literally waking up at five in the morning. The first thing you're doing is jumping in the Pacific Ocean, no matter what temperature it is. And then you go do your run. Cause I always try and tell, I meet these kids that like want to be seals and I'm like any, and you know, I'll put this out there on the podcast, my Instagram, Derek Janish 2020, you want to be a seal, send me a text and I'll, I'll give you a reality check and tell you where you're at in life. Yeah. And, if you, <laughs> and if I, if I think you can make it, I'm going to tell you. And if I think you got a lot of work to do, I'm going to tell you, but. Um, and then I, just so that they know it's Derek. Uh, and then can you spell out your last name? Yeah. Uh, J A N I S C H. Perfect. Yeah, yep. absolutely, man. Get a reality and, check real quick from, from Derek. <laughs> yeah, because I thought that too, you know, and it was, it took me two tries. I should mention that, you know, and, and keep this oh, humble. Yeah. I went through buzz twice. Yeah, I, went, I was in class 272 with like a lot of notable seals. Um, quit in hell week, so I know what it's like to like fail and then come back. Um, mm. And then to give you like numbers, right? We, 284 in my class, we started with 300 guys in pre-training. That's at Great Lakes. And we finished out of those 300, we finished with 13 and oh my gosh, and there was phenomenal athletes in those 300. It's like, and that's not to say like guys didn't get med rolled or performance rolled. Not, not every one of those guys ringing the bell, but mm -hmm. they didn't graduate on the, uh, like prescribed timeline. Yeah. So you have, you have first phase, second phase, third phase, and then SQT and to from like start to finish to become a seal from like boot camp to finish, it takes about 18 months to two years of just continuous training. One of what, one of the things Crazy. my dad would always tell me is Tyler, you gotta, you gotta know when to turn your brain off and just do yeah. shit. You know what I'm saying? Like he would always tell right. me that. And that has always stuck with me because there's a lot of things that I don't find the most fun or want to do all the time, 
but you know what has to be done. So you kind of just, you know, you flip the switch. And like when I was crawling under houses, I didn't want to crawl under this house, all these dead carcasses, right. and, you know, all these things. I was like, all right, <laughs> yeah. got to do this. You know, it's like, you just have to kind of go and, and hit that switch and then get it done, you know? For sure. And uh, I mean, I used to just tell myself like one foot in front of the other, everything mm -hmm. you do in life starts with one foot in front of the other. So yeah. if it's a run, if it's push-ups, to get to that point, you, you got to just keep moving. You keep going forward. Yeah. There's even in uh, when you're doing push-ups, how do you get the one foot in front of the other? I mean, to, you're, you're, you're doing, you're doing push-ups, right? You're right. And then the next evolution is going to be lunges and it's okay. going to be one foot in front of the other. If there you we suck go. at push-ups, yeah, go. push-ups is going to be your thing. <laughs> Thank you. Marcel, you yeah. see what I got to deal with, Tyler? I it's know, just, I know. He's has my it, business like, partner. Has, it hasn't changed, dude. How long have you known me, Derek? It's been it was, 15 years. Back to like time travel, back to math to math, right? I'd be <laughs> like, I, I was calling a lot of the plays on the field, right? Mike would yeah. yell at the guy in the snake. Polly would like quarterback the pit and the play, but like the actual line and where guys are going off the break, usually Mike and Polly trusted me to call that out. And I'd be like, Marcelo, I want you to go here and do this. And he'd be like, Three seconds before the break, you'd be like, Derek, no, I'm not going there. I'm going to do this. That's why you guys <laughs> lost I'm, without me. <laughs> and I'd just be like, I'd be like, I'd be like, Marcelo is doing his thing. And me and Mouse started working together. And, yeah. you know, it obviously like, worked out for Mouse. He's like it's, a Malloy. He's a Malloy. Yeah. I, I wasn't though. I was so disciplined on the team. Nothing like a Malloy. I think I, just, I think he's afraid of getting shot off the break. That's what I think. I, and, yeah, and you know, that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's no that's, an issue. Uh, that's no disrespect because Malloy is the best off the cusp. That's what I'm trying to say. Is like oh, that I guy. Know. Yeah. That guy off the off the just cusp of his sleeve. That guy just makes things happen. You know, hundred percent. I was actually saying I couldn't give myself that kind of credit at that yeah. age. I just yeah, I was like, yeah, I think I'm gonna get shot going here, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna stay alive yeah. and, and win the game at the end. <laughs> Marcel is also my only teammate ever that shot me on my own team, and this wasn't like this wasn't off the break in the pack. I had ran down the field, Tyler. Right. This yeah. was on Wait, a JT field. Oh, hold on. This is, is this not the story that you were, you, um, the same event, the XPSL? Same no, event. it wasn't. May have, may have even been the same point. I don't know, but okay. it's definitely, the, definitely it, the same event. No, it wasn't. I just realized because the XPSL event I was talking about was on Hyperball. Hmm. Just for the listeners, Tyler, to catch you up as well. When we were talking on the last show about, um, when I wiped the face it, that's right. At that event, Derek was messaging me and he's like, dude, I was there. It was the XPSL. We were all, uh, you're, yeah. you shot me that same event. So actually, I think it's different events now that I'm thinking about it. Cause this was for sure on a hyperball. No, cause you got to remember the XPSLs back then sometimes were half hyperball, half this, airball. This, no, this was not dude. Airball wasn't a thing yet. I'm see, I'm telling you, I was right, dude. Airball was not a thing yet. I don't, I don't think you were here. How, how old were you? Nine years old playing hyperball tournaments. <laughs> I was 11. <laughs> I was 11. <laughs> Anyways, back, well, back to my story. You got yeah. plenty more podcasts. I'm getting this story out there. Okay, okay. <laughs> I run down the right side of the field, right? I literally shoot like the last three guys. I'm stoked. You know, I'm, I'm going to be in all the paintball magazines in my head. Yeah. I grab the flag. I'm running back. And I just take one ball right in the center of the face. And I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, did I run by a guy? Like I checked all the bunkers off. I know I shot everybody. Yeah. And then I see Marcelo like just come up all like sheepish. He's like, my bad. My, Cause you know, you had to stand there and hold the flag after you got shot. So I'm standing there holding the flag. Marcelo comes up, takes it from me and literally goes and hangs the flag. I was like, Dude, that's dirty. So that's dirty. You're right. This was the same event. I'm, re I'm remembering all of it, but hold Whoa. on. But, but there was no JT field. This make, wasn't make up your mind. No, make up you, your mind. You're, I'm just saying you're wrong that it was on a JT field. This was on a hyperball field. This was 100% on a hyperball field. And, and you are right. It was XPSL in Vegas mm -hmm. uh, with die kids. Yeah. And it was, a hy kids. it was a hyperball field. So, so when he, when he arose from after making the shot, he was kind of like <laughs> yeah. checking to see if you're looking at him. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, I literally got to stand there like a goober, just holding yeah. this yellow flag, like <laughs> waiting for my teammate to come get it and steal all my glory. How did so, you feel Marcella? What was your, what were you feeling at that moment? You were like, you were felt like, like felt like I won the game, hung the yeah, flag. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> shot, thir shot thir Thirteen years old, shot him right in the face with the first ball. You know, yeah, like I, yep. I, I felt, good, I felt pretty good about the whole thing, to be honest. That's a damn <laughs> good with shot. my gun down and a flag in my hand. Let's keep that part in mind. <laughs> That's hilarious, man. 
Um, you know, that's yep. the great thing about paintball is we have, we have all these funny memories of like, nobody else will remember it, but they mean so much to us, you know? And then you, when you right. reconnect with those people, it's like, you got these great stories that you can tell. I think yeah. that's one of the greatest parts about paintball is all these, just these, these great stories, man. It's awesome. Well, that's, that's one of the funny things about, I don't know if either of you have younger brothers, but like, no matter how old your younger brother gets, like you always see him as your younger brother. Mm-hmm. And for me, Marcelo and Goldman were my two little brothers. We literally called them the gremlins, like the yeah. two gremlins. And Matt Cole, we got to give Matt Cole a shout out because there's oh, no without aftermath Matt Cole, dude. Yeah. without Matt Cole. <laughs> yeah, just, I forgot like, about was, Matt Cole, bro. See, wow. that's what I'm here for, dude, yeah, Matt Cole. Because yeah. yeah. none of us could rent vehicles, so we needed right. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was team, team papa for sure. Team yeah. papa bear. And man, Dude. how badass it is that we all got to play under Mike Kinman. I mean, let's talk about Hinge for a minute and what he, you know, what he's done for us. That's been amazing. Pretty wild. Yeah. I can't believe he's still doing it too. And and yeah. actually he looks better than ever. I just saw Mike at the field. Like he, he looks he looks stoked. He looks less stressed. Cause last time I talked to him about APX and you know, it's mm-hmm. it's all going well for him. The league, APX and aftermath. You can't complain there. No, yeah. yeah. He's got a lot going on for sure. Crushing it. Yeah. yeah. I've, and I new mean, aftermath looks good you know i'm do. i'm like yeah. the guy who like bought stock in aftermath in 2005 and i'm just like to the moon baby never selling <laughs> i got aftermath long sleeves i've been saving for 20 years <laughs> he's holding tough baby yeah that's right love that hell yeah, hell yeah. dude how about um world cup 2005 <laughs> with aftermath when uh me and mouse played that prank on you at the at the condos near old town <laughs> yep so wait oh, no. no i got I, got, I gotta correct your paintball history because it was orlando but it wasn't oh cup. yeah it Remember? wasn't cup you're right it was you're right it was that one year was, they had orlando twice i think it was the second event i think it, it was, was la orlando yeah. and then chicago uh pittsburgh and then you're cup right. You're, right. you're right so we're in orlando tyler and uh Dude, it was like standard for Alex and Marcelo just to make my life difficult as possible. <laughs> <laughs> we're, it's not hold enough on, that we're on. winning. Things have not changed, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not enough that we're winning every event we're playing. We're beating teams literally like 16-0. Go, go look at Palm Beach Vipers and, and, and look at the beating we gave those kids, you know. And yeah. uh, I, I come back to my room and literally every sink is just clogged. With like this weird, I don't even know what it was. Mouse said, just call it like a, a disgusting concoction. And I'm like, sure. That's oh, what it what was. color was it? All kinds of colors. But it was what? like oh, hold on. So, we, kind of- so we were we were we had these like hotel condos right near Old Town. Old Town, Old Town at that time, again, this is 2005, was like the cool place to be. We went to like a magic shop there and got a bunch of a bunch of stuff, like goo and disappearing putty, <laughs> like all sorts of shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can continue. I just uh, to clarify where we got all the all the all the parts. The goo. <laughs> yeah. So our like toilets clogged. Our sink is clogged. Like the bathroom sink is clogged. Like our room is just thrashed. And we knew exactly who it was. So it was probably like me, Phil Pony, uh, Justin, and maybe Ray. So there's a gap right between the gremlins yeah. and like the the 18 and up teen year old eight teenagers. And I was one of those mm-hmm. with like Ronnie Phil Pony, uh, Ray Amada. Justin Steinbach. I don't know how you yeah, say his Steinbach. last name, but Steinbach, yeah. yeah, Justin was there. So we're like, let's go get him. Let's get the gremlins. <laughs> so <laughs> we run in their hotel room. We find Mouse first and we just start throwing punches. This is all body <laughs> shots because Mouse acts like we murdered him and he yeah. screams. He dimes out Marcelo. He's like, he's hiding behind the fridge. <laughs> so, so, so Mouse and I set up the whole, the whole room with booby traps because we knew it was coming. <laughs> we knew it was coming. It was after we won. So what is this, we, Vietnam? Like, the lights yeah. were off. We, the, yeah, it, it, you know, this was our version. Yeah. It, was, it was the lights were off. We had all these booby traps, and Derek finds Mouse first and is beating him up. And Mouse just totally rats me out where I'm hiding because the plan was to have them come in. And we had all these things that we were gonna do to them. You know, we had like buckets of water that we were gonna spill, all sorts of shit. Mouse that threw fun. that whole game plan out the window and just ratted <laughs> Marcelo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you guys worked me over. We oh, did. Man. Yeah. It's all worth it. Yeah. But- I- I uh I got folded up in a futon and, and stuffed in like a corridor for hours one time on Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's brutal. But brutal. I have to say, Marcelo got the last laugh there because as I'm going to the airport, right? We'd we'd won the event, keep in mind, another event that we won. Yeah. And uh I'm going through airport security and I'm like, oh man, I got pulled aside 
and I'm thinking I forgot to take my tank off the rig or they're stealing my paintball gun. You know, as a kid, I'm like, not my oh, paintball no. gun. You know, I need that. And she's like, sir, you can't have any fruit in your bag. I'm like, I don't, I don't have any fruit. What are you talking about? She's like, no bananas. And Marcelo <laughs> had stuffed bananas into every part of my paintball gear bag. So like my barrel, my mask, you know, my pod pack. I, I'm telling you, Tyler, I get to the next practice <laughs> and I open my hopper and I find another banana in my hopper that I missed, that airport security missed. And I'm just like, dude, right? Because what are we trying to do here? Like a clown show or win paintball tournaments? <laughs> like, which one, Marcel? But I think that's why you guys were winning. I want to get to that too. Oh, like, no. why do you think you guys were winning so much? What was it? Just the, the talent? And you guys are having fun. You guys are best friends. You guys know each other, you know? Truthfully, I think that at that point in time, um, it was a circus, but SC Village, there was so much talent at any given Sunday. It was really like, who can make it to events? Who's got the motivation to like make it through a whole aftermath? Like if you went to SC Village in 2005 and said it's an aftermath practice, like everybody knew what that meant, you know? It meant mm -hmm. we were getting there at six o'clock in the morning and we weren't done playing until the sun went down. Yeah. And when you have that much talent and you got Hinman cracking the whip, like literally, yeah. Um, I think you're going to win. I mean, we had, yeah. we had the opportunity to practice against Ironman, Legacy, Dynasty, and we were D3 at the time. So like when you're getting reps against Dynasty and Ironman, and then you go play D3 kids from Palm Beach, Florida, you're going to smash them. It wasn't even, it wasn't For even sure. a competition. It was really just us racing to see how many points we could put on the board most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was, was the work ethic. It. <laughs> it was the work ethic and that that stemmed from Hinman that stemmed from Absolutely. from Mike Hinman man yeah he has a pedigree and a work ethic like nobody else and he brings that to any organization he's a part of you know anything he does whether it's you know his job or paintball or I'm sure everything you know he's just he works hard I think one of Mike's biggest gifts is his ability to recognize talent and heart like at, at its rawest form and early because mm -hmm. Mike always knew who to pick up and it was it was a meat grinder if you were not if you were not making the standard if you're not doing your job on the team you're going to get cut and there's going to be somebody instantly coming in to fill your spot and after we won Pomona and the way that we did um, we had we had dudes like literally knocking out the door to be on the team mm -hmm. I love that I love that design because it keeps people hungry you have to work or you're gone you know what I'm saying like you either work hard and you're you're going to be doing all the shit that we're doing or you're out of here, point blank. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That has to 100%. be, I've talked about this too, the, the teams that all coach in events now, that's like an absolute requirement. If everybody can't put in all the effort and dedication that it takes to, to win, which is something, you know, everyone sitting here also knows it takes that to win, then I'm not going to coach you in, in, in tournaments, you know? Um, I'll come out and do a clinic for you, but I'm not going to go and s spend time trying to win a tournament with you when, you're not giving me the basic requirements it takes for a team to succeed. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, man. All right. So, so Derek, let's, uh, it was fun. Some fun times, huh? They were good. Yeah. <laughs> there were some fun times. Enjoyed it. Obviously it was, it was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about how you started to kind of take that transition away from paintball and, and what kind of sparked that and, and motivated you to go on, on your, your next path. Yeah. And like I said, um, so originally yeah, the plan was to be a seal from day one, from like age 12, I was like, I want to be a Navy seal paintball kind of surprised me and threw me a rad curveball in life where I was like, maybe, maybe I'll do this paintball thing. And, uh, I enlisted in 2005 and I had orders. I don't know if you even knew this. I had orders to go to buds and be a seal that whole, that whole season. Like I was just literally a plane flight away. <clears throat> so every practice it was in the back of my head. And in my off time, I was running, I was swimming, I was doing pushups. I was, you know, Stu Smith, got to give him a shout out. Uh, David Goggins, obviously, he was yeah. the first seal I ever met in person was probably David Goggins in San Diego. So oh, wow. that was, that was kind of mind blowing. Cause I think he literally just broke the pull up record when I met him. He's, he's so, huge on <laughs> social media now. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and there's a lot of like, you know, there's these seal titans, I call them, like Jocko, Goggins, Eddie Gallagher. I'm like, I'm like the tier below those guys. And, yeah. and, you know, I still got goals and dreams, but there's, it's like anything. There's a certain caliber of men that just, like I said before, it's not matched anywhere else. So I left Aftermath. I was in regular Navy boot camp. Uh, 
I didn't get to buds training until I want to say like 2007 uh, was my first buds class. That was 272. And I dropped out of training, uh, quit in hell week. I could go into like a whole story about that, but um, really yeah. I, like for me, it was just like, don't make excuses, recognize what you got to work on and work on it. So I did that. I lived in Japan slash Korea for a year. I did a whole deployment overseas out there. And feel free at any time to dive deep on, yeah. on in these little areas because they're super valuable, the things that you learn uh, uh, in each one of these chapters too. I know that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird for me because um, like I said, I went through the part of training that gets everybody is called first phase, right? So you have buds in doc, uh, which is like three or four weeks. And then you have first phase, which is another month long. I want to say actually it's six weeks because you have three weeks pre hell week, you have hell week, and then you have like two weeks after hell week. And that's what gets everybody, right? Everybody knows how week that's in all the documentaries of you got to stay up for a week straight and you're like delirious by the end of it. But if you make it, you have like a 70% chance of being a Navy SEAL, whereas before you had like a 10 to 20% chance of being a Navy SEAL. No shit. So I did that. No. I did that twice and didn't make it in my first hell week and then made it my second hell week in class 284. So let, let's, let's explain hell week. Do you mind like kind of walking us through really what that process is about? And, and actually the first time, like what, why didn't you make it? What was the... The breaking point that you didn't make it yeah it's good uh obviously it's not like my favorite chapter to talk about but um mm -hmm. it's probably good for the listeners especially if there's kids out there that want to be navy seals and that's their dream uh 100 it, it should be talked about mm. um yeah so you start off there's four evolutions you have four mile time runs uh that you have to pass like because i always hear people like oh, it's mostly mental toughness right i'm like well yeah after your <laughs> physical stud after you can run, after you can run four miles, <laughs> after you can pass the the seal screening test, uh, after you can pass the two mile ocean swims, timed O course, and then that's four, right? Mm -hmm. um, those four things. You, no, I don't care if you're a Shaolin Jackie Chan monk. If you can't pass the O course, <laughs> if you can't swim two miles in the ocean, if you can't do the four mile time run and pass the seal screener, the PSD, you're not going to be a seal, like hands down. Yeah. You're just not. Is there timed evolutions uh, that that suck? Every one of them is hard. Every one of them you have to like give max effort at, unless you're just like a phenomenal runner. Which even those guys they usually struggle at something else later. That's they call buds the great equalizer because if you're a championship wrestler, usually you suck at swimming. If you're a Michael Phelps swimmer, usually you hate upper body stuff, right? Mm. So like you get to buds and it's designed to like break you down and and show you at some point you're gonna have to rely on your teammates. You're going to have to dig deep and you're going to have to find something that you're going to tap into that you didn't even know was there. And for me, that was, that was hell week, hands down. Um, the, the reason I don't like talking about my first hell week was because I tested positive for this thing called chlamydial pneumonia it has nothing to do with chlamydia. It's just a weird strain of pneumonia that I got essentially from uh, ingesting seagull poop, probably in the Bay. So I tested positive for that. They're like, Hey, we can medical roll you and you can go to the next class and heal up which sounded terrible to me because that meant I was doing everything I just did all over again. Mm. Or you can go through Hell Week and see how you do. And essentially in Hell Week, I was, I was literally glyking out. My uh, O2 levels and my glycogen were just completely depleted. I was passing out. I remember passing out on an instructor and like waking up to him shaking me and then like punching me being like, don't Whoa. you ever pass out on me and i was like dude I don't, I don't even know where i am so that's so heavy it, duty wow oh, it was it was not and this was like my life dream slipping away whereas like yeah. um and i pride myself on just being like yeah i quit but to this day like i didn't ring the bell i never actually physically say like i quit they're just like dude like you're done you know what i mean like we mm -hmm. get that you got a hard kid but like you're done you know mm -hmm. so that was yeah. that was the end of my uh my first buds class but you didn't give up man you never gave, I didn't up. give up no i was yeah. passing out on the instructors yeah and um and it was awkward because the part that nobody really else talks about is um buds is weird because it's individual with like your four mile time runs your ocean swims but then it's also you have a boat crew you do everything with six to seven guys in your boat crew and they break you by a high line right so they're like everybody lines up and they start chopping it off of like six guys. It depends on how the math breaks out. If your boat crew is going to be six or seven. So like the first tallest guys that are all like six, four to six, three, they're boat crew one. I was boat crew two. I'm about six, two and was like two Oh five in buds. Uh, and you do everything with those guys. That's like your squad. Mm. Um, and when I say everything, that means like running with boats on your head, doing log PT, 
doing going to chow together, doing your your room inspections together. Like everything is done with your bow crew or your swim buddy. So it's kind and of like uh, paint, like paintball, just kind of rolls like right in. You know, you're like, yeah. all right, I have my team here. I got my team here. Yeah. Yeah, and and trust me, other seals have like seen me talk blue in the face of like this is just like paintball because I'm a yeah, paintball yeah. nerd first, like I said. And then, <laughs> Navy SEAL second, but hey, uh, we are too, brother. We we're big, the biggest paintball nerds ever. <laughs> right. I mean, that's why we got the podcast, right? It's yeah. like, it's like form, <laughs> form to explore it. So, uh oh, update oh. my phone. That's all right. I'm still here. Yeah, He's back. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, all right, Hell Week, right? Yeah. Basically, you just like ran out of gas in the tank. And I don't mean it like um, like I said, it's so hard to explain. And it's one of those things where I've never been once in my life, you know, I fought in Afghanistan. I've climbed like literal mountains in Alaska. And this, this training brought me to a point where I, I couldn't even stay awake anymore. I was just passing out every time I stood up. I think the most, the biggest takeaway for me is that you never fucking quit. And even after you failed here, you allowed the failure right. to be your power source right. in, into the future. I took it as like, you know, you got a major penalty, you were tied up and now you're down a point. Like yeah. you're, you're starting at a disadvantage, but you're not at a game. You're not at a tournament. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how, what, like and that. for me, what, uh, <clears throat> I think a strength of mine and even in war, you know, I was talking to my, my good friend about this. Who's a writer asked me like, wh why do you think there's so much humor in war? And why, why do you think military guys have such a dark humor? And mm -hmm. I think, cause when you're tired, you're completely exhausted. It's like the last thing you have control of. If you can make a joke and make light of the situation when you're seeing just like stuff your mind can't even comprehend, like your buddy's blood or like, you know, human remains, like having a sense of humor about it lets you kind of take the moment back. Damn. Yeah, yeah that's a wild one too. Imagine. That that yeah. that makes a lot of sense though. It really does. Um, I, I yeah, I, I hear you. Um, hmm. dude, so these uh these hell weeks, how far how far apart was the, your first uh bud training from your second how long did you have to wait to think, uh, to get another chance it was pretty much exactly two years and i was pretty lucky wow. because um uh and man I, I forget this guy's name he was an eod guy i want to say nielsen too like marcus but uh obviously no relation um i was in japan dude and i had to wake up at like five in the morning to go do the the physical screener test it's um it's two minutes of push-ups two minutes of sit-ups max pull-ups uh, 500 yard swim and then a mile and a half run in pants and boots and oh you know, there's gosh. all these and you gotta hit like i think my numbers are like 84 push-ups uh like 90 something sit-ups i did 22 pull-ups uh my mile and a half run was like nine minutes nine nine something mm -hmm. and then my swim i had a really good swim that time it was like a 745 and those numbers matter to like the, the kids on Reddit that are, are going to fact check me later. So don't worry. <laughs> um, which Marcelo knows. I don't know. I got my trident. All right. I did it. I did. Yeah. The thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 So this um, was the second, this was the second hell week you're saying. And yeah. Was, this was in preparation man. for that. Oh, in prep for the second hell week. Right. I had okay, to, gotcha, I had to gotcha. screen again. Gotcha. I had to like, okay. You okay. Have to, it's a lot like applying for college. I guess I should explain that better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you have to, you have to send all your scores to a detailer. And then that guy, before you even get to buds, you're already screened. Like, is this guy is even worth our time to give him a spot at buds. Gotcha. And me being a guy that had been before I had quit already. And I was a little bit older now. I think I was like 24 or 25, my second time going through training. Um, but yeah, long story short, I got, I got orders, got the class 284 and then literally went through everything I just did all over again. And then this time I was just, stronger and more mentally fit but truthfully um i think it was just not having pneumonia not being sick like, yeah not, not being, being sick because you you sorry it just pretty rough really quick. you were always a freak athlete so I, I, they like if anyone was gonna do it it's like robbie pentinelli we talked about him i mean he went off and became a seal and it's like yeah i could see that you know um right i, I, I almost wonder if the the detailer that you know looks at your file for the second time around you would almost assume that it's a, a bonus, your situation, you know, like, man, he still wants to be here. He's coming back. He like, there's something about that. Don't you think, you know, that, that for that sure, you, before, you know, but um, I mean, dude, they, from my generation, they have the statistics down to a science for who's going to make it mm -hmm. um, at least like on paper, right. There's still this X factor that I don't think they quite have figured out. 
But um, if you have, they call it like elevated PTS or PST scores now. And um, they're kind of just looking at the numbers, man. Okay. All right. Yeah. So if you gotcha. have those like higher, higher swim times, higher run times, and you're in like the above 80 to 90 pushups, sure. they have, you're physically ready for the training. Now the mental part is where you would get into like, all right, this guy's doing it twice. Like that could go either way. Sure. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see that. It's really a I coin see. toss. It, it depends on what is doing the evaluation, you know, mm -hmm. what is a PST? A uh, physical screening test. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. When we get into the military talk, there's a whole bunch of acronyms that I got to break down yeah. for you guys. Yeah, yeah for absolutely. sure. Yeah. Just uh, for, for our own clarification, obviously, because this is a world that I'm not familiar with, you know, I'm, I'm just truly not. Um, yeah. I don't have any family that has served. I mean, my dad's, my dad's uncle, um, I believe he did. He got a purple heart in the air force nice. in, you know, but my dad was so much older. I never met my grandfather. I never met my uncle, never met any of that. But other than that, you know, I don't have any sort of, you know, military background or anything like that in, in my family. So this is all, all pretty new to me. It's inspiring too, man. Yeah. Let me just be the first to say truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I appreciate that. And it's, it's a weird thing now because I'm a little older, 33, I've been to war, won paintball tournaments. What I've come to realize is there's different aspects of your own self. You know, like I, I tap into older versions of myself and I'm like, okay, what was my mindset? What was my diet? What was I doing that worked so well for me mm -hmm. that I want to do when I'm preparing for either this MMA fight or I'm preparing for this paintball tournament or whatever your next chapter of life is, you know? One of the, mm -hmm. the biggest things David Goggins ever told me that always stuck with me was Bud's is not the pinnacle. You know, he's like, every seal has his brown shirt. Every seal has been through hell week. He's like, there's mm -hmm. other mountains you got to climb. There's other things you got to accomplish. And that like blew my mind because just being able to make it through Hell Week to me was like, I did it, you know, like I, I yeah. got my trophy, I, I got my reward, but he was that's, right. And there's a same, mm -hmm. go ahead. That's like, and I, actually I want to stop myself from saying this because it's, it, it's just, I know you draw a lot of parallels to paintball. I'm not trying to diminish at all becoming a SEAL because they're not alike, but it's, I, I guess, relatable to like when you do finally turn pro in paintball, a lot of players think they've made it, but they haven't right. like the work's just getting started actually. And you have to now build a name for yourself. You have to now go and accomplish great things, you know, yeah. and, and, and it isn't there. I, I hope that's not a disrespect. No, that, that makes way, sense. You know? Not at all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Not at all. And, and like I said before, the, uh, that's what I'm here to do is to kind of bridge those gaps and say, what's, what's, what's the same, what's not, what works and what doesn't, what's, mm -hmm. what's the best that we can take away from paintball. What's the best that we can take from elite special forces. Cause you know, not just seals, there's, there's army Rangers, there's SF, there's MARSOC, there's, mm -hmm. you know, force recon, there's the air force para jumpers. All of them each have something that just makes them these superb athletes and just have that champion mindset that isn't everywhere. Yeah. But Man, the seals so are like true. the most elite, I think, right? I mean, yeah. uh, that'd like be like that. me asking you, <laughs> is Dynasty the best paintball team? You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. So, yeah. Well, there you go. You know? <laughs> there you go. Who, yeah. who shot Bin Laden? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually, yeah, Navy SEALs. Damn, saw that movie. Mm -hmm. That wasn't me, though. That was that was Team 6. I was Team 7 for the uh, the fact checkers as well. Seal, wow. Seal team 6. So, yeah. so at that same time when that all happened, where were you at when that was happening? I was in training. I think I was in SQT when, uh, wait, wait, you're talking about the Bin Laden raid? Yeah. 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 I remember being in SQT and uh, crazy story. One of the, one of the guys in my, S so, okay, you finished buds, right? That's the mm -hmm. first six months. That's just like the yeah, kick of the nuts. It, it, if, you, if you don't mind, before we go in, into that, I, I just want to kind of finish with hell week. I want, I want like the, I want the listeners and myself. I'm so curious as to like what the data Which part? The, the hell week I nope. didn't make and the hell week I made it in. The one he made, the one he made, mm -hmm. um, All right, you so. know, of like, of like no sleep, you know, like I want, I want everyone to understand how difficult this process was, you know, and, and what it takes to accomplish that. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people, especially like, uh, I don't know, I don't even want to say it, but like, there are certain drugs you can take to stay awake for a while, right? Obviously, okay, well, sure. we're not condoning any of that. We're not condoning caffeine use because people think it's literally just like lack of sleep. Like, oh, I, I could stay up all week. That's that's no problem. I'm like, okay, now double your day and double your workouts. So if you're running 10 miles a day and that was really hard, now you're running 20 miles a day because you're running all night. And when the sun mm. goes down 
and everybody else is going to sleep, you're still doing push-ups, you're still running, you're still jumping in the ocean. Like that doesn't stop. Dude. All they do is they, they add another meal. So you're eating four meals now. And that's your, like, that's your other break. Essentially you get four meals you eat. That's the one difference between Tyler. I'll tell you the Rangers is Rangers are amazing at running with rucksacks and starving themselves. Like, I don't get it. Mm -hmm. Like they love to just punish their bodies. <laughs> Seals are like, no dude, like we want to eat as much as we can. We want to mm -hmm. lift heavy things. And then we want to go to war. Yeah. But like, you don't sleep. The so they do, do the Rangers sleep? Cause I don't know. I think I, they, they, I think I would take the sleep. Somewhere. I think I'd take the sleep over the <laughs> eating. <laughs> I don't know, man. Food's powerful, dude. It, especially when you know you're gonna get fed. It's like it's like like lead, leading the horse to the stables. You know, he knows he knows he's done for at least even if it's five minutes, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It kind of yeah. it recharges your batteries, right? Okay. That's how my uh, my dad picked up chewing red man chewing tobacco because you know you get bored and that you're not you're not eating or whatever and you throw some chew in there and start start gnawing on that chaw. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that was a different generation, man. We had we had yeah. nutritionists. For me, if it, you know, I used to always say, um, addicted to pain, pleasure is poison. If it, if, if I was putting it in my body and it didn't like give me more energy, better rest or better recovery, I was like, why am I doing it? You know, I hardly yeah. drank. I never smoked. Like everything I did was fuel for this machine that wanted to be a Navy SEAL. Mm. Yeah. My dad was born in 63. So definitely God, that's a different era, man. <laughs> guys, different. <laughs> different, different era. And God yeah. bless those guys, because they, especially, yeah. so you said your dad was combat. That must have either been like Panama, Gr Grenada. It was Grenada, yeah. See, I'm, yeah, come on, yeah. bro. Like, yeah. not a lot of airborne dudes that mm -hmm. had, had combat back then. So if he was part of that operation, that was a big deal. Yeah, he was, he was a pretty high up uh, officer. And like, he would, he would drive around um, pretty serious government officials and he would protect, you know, he was there to protect, um, and man, I'm, I honestly just feel like the luckiest kid in the world. That was my dad, you know, like I got to grow up with that dude and he hardwired me to be, uh, you know, a part of the Oakland assassins in NorCal there. Yeah. So I, I'm so wow. grateful for that. Yeah. Airborne, airborne's no joke, man. Um, mm -hmm. I was a static line jump master as well. I was lucky enough to do that, to get to put guys out of airplanes, but that's like, you know, the army paratrooper. And I always used to joke. Mm -hmm. Only the army designs a parachute that's meant to be crash landed, where it's just like a green round bubble, and you're just praying that you hit the ground and don't break your legs. Like, oh man, he's he's got some that's funny wild. stories of people getting wrecked, just absolutely wrecked. wrecked. Yeah. One day when I'm an old man and all all I'm doing is just drinking beers and telling war stories, I want to get lawn chairs and watch that training and just watch the next generation of kids <laughs> yeah. just coming in hot, man. It's, just, oh, yeah. it's, just, it's like it's like a sack of potatoes hitting the ground. It's yeah. not pretty. There's no way to make that look cool, you know? No, it's it's gonna be brutal. Um yeah. and and hell, dude, like I want to pick back up in Hell Week because that that shit's crazy too. Yeah, Hell Week, I mean it's always like the uh the the topic of conversation when you're trying to explain like why is SEAL mm -hmm. training so tough. Um, but for me, it was almost like it was just one of those things where I knew I had to do it. I knew I had mm -hmm. to like just stay in that mindset of like, make it to the next meal, really the sunrises. And I've heard you talk about prana. I've been preaching that for years. Yeah. Like every sunrise, I said a prayer where I'm like, at least the instructors don't have the night anymore because the night brings cold. And to me, I'm, <laughs> I'm a real spiritual Christian where like, I'm feeling <laughs> Jesus on every sunrise. I'm like, I'm yeah, like, Jesus, amazing. I need your back. You know, yeah. if you want me to be a seal, I need some of that. I need some of that magic glow in my heart right now, because this is miserable. Like, yes. Well, and there's food, there's, it. there's food in the light, man. There is, 100%. you get it, it, it charges you. And like you said, prana, um, there's like, you list, you read ancient Egyptian text, and these guys were breathing in light. They would not eat for a long time. They would drink water and they would breathe light. And that's how they meditated. And, and there's so much power in the light. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I like to say we're, we're human beings have, or spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you're like, you're organic, like you're a flower kind of, that's kind of the, you know, like you need water, you need light. And, and the, if you don't have those things, it does have a tremendous effect on, on the way you feel. It really does. Um, and there is science. Those things you die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. We're, we're, we're complex plants with emotions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to grow, you know, we're trying to grow and, and it's a, it's a, it's a painful process sometimes, but 
um, when we have brothers and sisters to lift us up and keep us strong, it keeps us moving, you know? For sure. Yeah. Hell week. Have we covered hell week? What are your, what are your questions? Yeah. Like I think that, mental, I think that we yeah, have toughness. I've, that's it's, it's again, the sleep. Like, do you literally not sleep for seven days or do you sleep for like 30 minutes a night? You get, you get a nap on Wednesday. All right. So breakout starts on Sunday night. Yeah. Sunday night. Uh, like, I don't, they, they don't tell you, they surprise you like machine okay. gun fire and it's blanks. It's not, it's not that crazy, yeah, but it's yeah, still yeah. pretty crazy. And yeah. they're like throwing off RD Sims, which are like fake grenades that blow up and they're really loud. They're creating chaos. It's like a mock right. gunfight. And this is tradition. They, they've been doing this since the first buds class. Mm -hmm. Like, so they kick it off at that. Uh, you get to your boat crew and then you, you literally just start running like with your boats on your heads. Like this is every Navy SEAL like knows this position because you have your handle and you have a boat on your head that just bounces and it's miserable. <laughs> and you're like, where are we going next? It really doesn't matter. Just follow the instructors who that was to me the wildest thing. And Eddie Gallagher was one of my instructors. So shout out to Eddie. Everything you do, every run you do, an instructor does with you and leads it. So you're chasing wow. him with these boats. And if you're running 10 miles, one of the instructors is doing it with you and probably beating you and, and doing it better. So Lead you, by run, example. <clears throat> mm -hmm. you run, you carry logs, you go in the ocean like more times than you can count. Like literally, I could not tell you how many times you're just in and out of the ocean to like create that misery. And they'll, they'll fuck with you sometimes. They'll make you think you're done getting wet and being cold. And then they'll be like, turn around, forward march, like take seats right back in the ocean. You're doing flutter kicks for the next hour. And you're just like, dude, we just did lunges like for the last hour. And like, yeah. now we're doing flutter kicks. So like, you're just, and that's where you got to turn your brain off. You're like, all right, whatever, you know, one foot in front of the other. And that, mm. Marcel, in this case is this, you're just, you know, <laughs> uh, flutter kicks. So you if get you to haven't Wednesday. Been training, you've always like, seemed like a little bit of a flutter cake, you know? <laughs> a little flutter cake. Dude, if you right? haven't, if you have not been training your ass off for this, you're not going to make it. You know what I mean? No, you're not. That's why no I always way. tell people like, no it's, people tell me mental toughness, like as like, it's a chess match or no. like, as if it's like, I always picture like, you know, Van Damme doing splits over coals. I'm like, that's pretty <laughs> mentally tough, but like, but that's not going to get you very far. You know what I mean? Like the instructors yeah. be like, okay, dude, get off the coals and you're running now. Like, so <laughs> you got to run a lot, like more running than you ever thought you would do. Mm -hmm. uh you get a you get a nap on wednesday of hell week and i'll never forget because my first time i didn't make it to the nap i didn't get nap time and it's about i don't know between 45 minutes and an hour and a half it really just depends on your class and but what's this going is on. the first time you've slept first time you slept from sunday night so all night sunday all day monday all day tuesday sunrise wednesday and then you get a nap wednesday afternoon and it's literally like i think i slept about 45 minutes and they wake you up and they, this was the most bizarre part that I'll never forget. They, he's really quiet, really like nice. He's like, Hey man, he's like, you want to quit? And I was like, no, he's like, well, your nap's over. He's like, he's like, there's something waiting for you in the ocean. And he just meant go jump in the ocean again. And he's like, Shh. he's like, don't wake up the other guys. Cause they were waking us up like two or three at a time Whoa. just to mess with us. Like real, yeah. no, no, no strategy there. <laughs> and uh, dude, I had never been so sore and so just delirious in my life. And of course, every ounce of your body was like, forget this, dude, go back to sleep. <laughs> like just, just fall in the sand right there and call it good. You know, nobody, nobody, who cared? Nobody in my family, none of my friends were like, Derek, we really need you to be a Navy SEAL. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like we need this from, you know, like, not one, everybody was like, Navy SEAL, why are you going to do that? Are you from Orange County? Don't you have like a good life? <laughs> like yeah. just live your life, kid. And uh, I was like, no, that's not good enough. I'm going to be a SEAL. So I get back from the ocean you get back with your bow crew and it's more running, man. It's, it's just running. And then it gets to Thursday night and actually Thursday night becomes fun. Cause they say, if you see the sunrise Wednesday morning, you gotta get, you're going to make it through hell week for the most part. Like nobody quits after the nap on Wednesday and uh, you get one more nap Thursday. And then the, like the last thing I think you do is called paddle around the world where you literally in a little, it's called IBS inflatable boat small and your little rubber boat, you paddle from uh, the strand at Coronado, all the way around North Island, all the way to the other side of Coronado. So you literally paddle, like I'm talking rowing, row, row, row your boat around <laughs> Coronado Island. And it takes wow. something ridiculous, like eight to 12 hours, depending on tides and the current and whatnot. Holy and I had smokes. like, I had like carpal tunnel from doing this. I remember like feeling like a T-Rex. I looked like <laughs> Tom Hanks from Castaway with T-Rex <laughs> arms when I finished Hell Week. Like I had bleach 
bleached blonde eyebrows. Like I was all scruffy and like, I could not lift my arms past doing this, you know? Did you at least have Wilson? I didn't have Wilson. No, I had, <laughs> no, I had my bow crew and I have to say, dude, I had some just straight killers in my bow crew that like talk about, I was talking to Marcelo about this before the, uh, before the show. There's this look you can get between paintballers, Navy SEALs, and MMA fighters where it's like, hey, are you going to make that bunker off the break? Like, hey, man, are you going to knock this dude out? And they're, they're like, they give you that like, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I am. And like, you look at your bow crew and you get charged up and you're like, all right, man, you're not quitting. I'm not quitting. Let's go, bro. Yeah. Like, that's 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 the look you want in your boys, you know? And it, and it carries into war because there's sometimes you don't have time to talk, you know, I don't have time mm -hmm. to explain to my squad, like, Hey, we're going to take that Hill. And then we're going to do mm -hmm. an X, Y, Z maneuver. I'm just like, Hey bro, you two with me, let's go now. And they're I like, think this is something, let's go. this is something that I implement into my paintball a lot. I think for my guys, I think that they would say that, uh, that they can get a look from me and, and pretty much well know where I'm at, you know, right. on the field. Um, and vice versa. I can look at Yarbrough. I can look at, you know, my guys and we, we know we're going to get it done, you know? Yeah, it's powerful. And it's almost like, I want to say like psychic in that point, you just kind of yeah. know, you're just like, you're transferring information from like pineal gland to pineal gland or whatever Dude. it is. Yeah. You're on that wavelength and, and you know, he received it, whatever you're, you're putting out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something said about that. And um, I mean, there have been countless studies, whether they're published or not on this type of stuff that we're talking about. And there is a lot of power to that. There's people that you put them in different rooms and they can see what's in the other room. They've, they've done right. crazy studies about this. There's, there's something there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For sure. Some type of magic, you know, human magic that we have that we haven't been taught about. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm, I'm curious about this. What do you mean you can put people in different rooms and you <laughs> yeah. can see Marcella, what's in the other Marcella room? What are we talking about the here? Voice, voice of reason well, they, again. They did a, it's called, they did it's a, called remote viewing, right? Is that what yeah, you're going with? That's uh -huh. correct. Yeah, remote viewing. They also did a movie where like with a lot of famous actors, I can't forget the guys, but it was something about goats. like Men uh, who stare at goats. I love yeah, that movie. Men who that's stare at goats. That's on, based on, on real army experiments. Yeah, so there's a lot of things. And I, I was going to say that it's also, you know, most of it's happening in the in the government <laughs> you know that's but where let's it's say, all can, can you explain this a little bit of time I'm, I'm genuinely curious so like yeah. what, what were these uh -huh. studies like what like well there's certain individuals okay yeah there's certain individuals that um can remotely view what's going on without optically visually seeing it with their eyeballs they can see it in their mind's eye and they can see what is in another room and describe it um to a t pretty much and not and, and and not be there and not be looking at it and be able to see things that is interesting i need to see yeah. these studies yeah I wish, yeah i wish we had a jamie like like rogan has i know i said jamie pull it up dude yeah yeah exactly <laughs> we need this right now when, when to... you guys are famous that's the job i want ty like i just want to dude, be you're jamie hired for your podcast like <laughs> you're i'll hired. google it i'll be so fast man already, already <laughs> i'll be so I, fast <laughs> i already know what you want to pull up i'm like here you go bro dude we are <laughs> honored Honor we'll, to we'll have you that clip of, of world cup 2008 where marcelo does whatever yeah, yeah. i'm on it, <laughs> on it. I, like I, pr it I pray i pray we get big enough to where we can have you part of this squad and, and have you pulling up things man that's the dream right there we'll do it from the moon too all of it we're doing all of it did you guys see elon musk is going to put a literal dogecoin on the literal moon <laughs> Yeah. What's up? <laughs> yes. Is he really? That's what he said. He yeah, tweeted about it today. That's crazy. Right. Paul and Ingrid. 100%. And I'm, yep. And I'm going to check out with uh, Adrian, <clears throat> one of them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys, for the uh, for the listeners. Derek had it. Checking in. I know um, you're down in San Diego right now. You, you work and, and live kind of on site where you work with veterans with PTSD and stuff, right? Yeah. And you know, you say PTSD. Um, I wanted to put that out there on the podcast too. Um, yeah. PTSI, man, that's powerful. Post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress injury because mm -hmm. you don't want it to define you. And for me, it kind of did yeah. for a bit. And um, wow. I like, I like that. that yeah. 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 Post-traumatic stress injury because that's, that's that it just like verbiage or whatever. Yeah. Helped me out a lot with like my, uh, well, it can we be talk healed. It can mm -hmm. be healed that it way. Be healed. It, it, and, it's a, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not going to interrupt, but yeah, I, I hear you, man. That's I like that. Well, I here, I just want to say it's the power of the word, right? We were talking about sure. this. It's about it's about uh -huh. the power of the spoken word. It, it holds so much energy. So when you change that word from disorder to injury, there's no disorder. 
here. It is an injury that we are healing and we're going to be set, you know, we're going to be set on the right path. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about, man. Like, and I can just feel my demeanor change when I go into it. Cause when I'm talking paintball and I'm talking about like, you know, old times of the beach is yeah. one thing, but then when you go into like Afghanistan, some of the training, like I have friends that lost lives. I have friends that lost limbs or eyesight. It's, it's wild, man. Like the stuff we did on a day-to-day basis, it still blows my mind that it happened and that I was a part of it. It's, 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 it's hard to like grasp all of that. And man, you, that, I don't know that it can be, it's such, it's so much it's uh, it's, you know, that is, um, it's powerful what you've done in, in your life, you know, and you have had such a tremendous effect on so many people's lives too, you know, with, with your spoken words and, and your help that you're doing right now in this building that you're sitting at and you're, you know, you're helping people to, uh, to acclimate, you know, and, and like you said, they're not, they're not in fire anymore. You're not in, you know, in the live action. And that's something that is, uh, takes a lot of training and, and, you know, nurturing. Yeah. And, um, I want to touch on veterans militia. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but they're a paintball group. I've played with veterans militia in the past. And the biggest thing I noticed for my own like depression and anxiety and all that is when you get out of the SEAL teams, you get out of the Marine Corps, you lose that sense of community, you lose your team, yeah. but there's, there's teams out there for you still. You just got to be proactive now and find your team. You got to find your tribe, as I would say. So important. Absolutely. Yeah. I can imagine. Cause you guys, I mean, you literally brothers out there that depend on each other for survival. And so when you come back to, normal land not having that has to be such a tough shift in um in in just like your your maybe not your worth but just like you know finding finding your way without those brothers around you all the time it's mm-hmm. important to have a good circle that that you can rely on mm-hmm. for sure and just like <clears throat> you know when you guys are telling paintball stories it's different when you're telling paintball stories to tyler mm-hmm. by telling paintball stories to somebody you just met in the grocery store right because you have a mm-hmm. common ground Totally. You have a you have a uh, a language that you're speaking. Essentially, you're learning a different language. When you say you know charger, when you say you know D three is hot, like Tyler knows what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. If you say, "Hey, I need you to shoot the home," like other people, are like, "What? You're gonna shoot the home?" <laughs> when <laughs> when I mean? when I, when I say, "Hey, do you think we could kill the god?" Uh, to yeah. Tyler, he gets it. When <laughs> oh, I say that yeah. to somebody at the grocery store, it's not okay. <laughs> it's right. not okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the same thing as being being special forces, man. Like just getting into yeah. like talking about the vehicle I was in, talking about you know. Right. So if I said Marcelo, I was doing um, SF operations in a Mat V in sort of Southwest Herat, like you know, and yeah. I flew into Kandahar, you'd be like, "What, bro? You lost me, right?" Totally. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. Like, I yeah, carried yeah. a Mark Forty Eight yeah. machine gun. Like, right. you'd be like, okay, I know what a machine gun is. And, right. And usually, civilians will want to like latch on to like that one word they understood. And like, yeah. I'm like, dude, that's just setting up my story, like to explain of how I was ambushed and how I was like worrying I was gonna run out of ammo and how, like, man, just getting mm-hmm. into it. Um, there was a mission I went on where over the radio we had a call sign. And it was like six down eagles. And that means down eagle means a seal is either critically wounded. Like he's either dead or uh, non-mobile. Like he needs to be ambulanced out, like helicopter, medevaced out. And I was like, six, dude, we only brought, we only brought 12 seals on this op. So that's half our squad. I'm like, well, I'm like, that's, that's half our force. I'm like, we're fucked. <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. And I, I can't like come back over the radio because I was shooting at the time. Like I'm getting shot at, I'm shooting back. I'm hearing explosions. And I just heard over the radio that six of my buddies are either dead or critically wounded. And I'm like, all right, now the mission is survive, survive and save your buddies. Well, luckily that was a, a I don't want to say a bad report, but it, um, the guy that passed that over the radio meant to say two Eagles wounded and four ally wounded. Cause we had what was called the ANASF Afghan national army special forces. Every mission I went on and well, not every mission, but the majority of missions I went on, we had an Afghan national army, uh, partner for us that we were training and deploying with and the goal was to teach them how to do seal operations so that they could run their own country but you're taking guys that barely knew how to read and write and expecting them to do what navy seals who've been training since they were 12 years old to do you know what i mean mm-hmm. that's like that was the difference in pedigree there 
Yeah. Anyways, we got we got ambush, had grenades thrown at us. Um, some of my buddies got wounded, and four of our partner fours were like critically wounded. And, and is that this was in a night. city or where? What's this the was, setting? Um, yeah, this is. I mean, it's hard to call it cities because they're like they're like shanty towns. They either yeah. have these like mud compounds, mm-hmm. um, and then just the way Afghanistan is built, it's like there's like one nice part of town, and then everybody like sets up uh, based off of that. Yeah. And we were going after this guy at night, um, and I don't know if we got compromised on the insert, meaning like they knew we were coming, or or they just ambushed us like they were waiting. It almost seems like they're waiting because they like they were just really man i'm trying to like think how i put this into like a term mm-hmm. that the audience can digest uh mm-hmm. i've been in firefights before but this one specifically it's like they knew we were coming and they were pretty well set up because like every time i got shot at the guy would move and i would just see like muzzle flash uh, an explosion and then i would get shot at from a different angle and when you're getting mm-hmm. shot at from just one guy in front of you that's one thing, but when you're getting shot at from three different angles, and these are like bullets now and not paintball, it's a different mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. I always try and tell people like the biggest difference between war and paintball is paintball, it's five on five. You start on other sides of the field, even if it's rec ball, right? It's still, I know the bad guys are in front of me and I know my guys are somewhere on this line with me. Yeah. Well, in war, you could be patrolling through a market and an RPG hits, you know, the, the guy in, you know, the point man your patrol. And now you're in a, you're in a contact, you're in a tick, troops in contact. And you have to find cover, um, get your three Ds out there, distance, direction, description, and now you got to fight back, and you got to create that front line. You got to create that what we call white space or working mm-hmm. space, where you know my biggest fear always was shooting my own buddies like in the back of the head because he's doing a risky maneuver, or I'm just not exactly sure where the enemy is because at night on night vision goggles, like it just gets squirrely. I don't know how else to like explain that. Oh, of course, yeah, and. And the three D's that's pivotal. Yeah. You got to set that perimeter. You got to know exactly what you're approaching and how you're going to approach that and attack it. Yeah. That's... I, I can't I'm, imagine. I'm correct that... you. Oh no, just perimeter. Cause perimeter means something different to us. Perimeter is at the end of a firefight when you're creating um, okay. a circle around you guys and protect you, you're creating a, a line of skirmish is a, a more mm. proper term. Mm. Because I'm pretty big on that when I'm when I am going to story tell like combat. So I don't do this often, man. Yeah. So like yeah. if I'm going to yeah. no, story tell it. in the audience, and there's going to be seals out there and buddies of mine that watch this and they're going to yeah. be like, nah, dude, come on, use mm-hmm. the right, use the right terms. Awesome. I love so that. that. Yeah. You're setting up a, a, a line of skirmish perimeter is afterwards when like kind of the dust is settled. And that's when you're getting like your ammo count, you know, making sure everybody has their sensitive equipment, meaning their night vision goggles, their radio. It's kind mm-hmm. of like, it's kind of like when you get back in the pits, you're like, all right, I need air, I need paint mm-hmm. and I need to clean off my goggles, right? Like what I need to be able to see, I need mm-hmm. to be able to shoot. And I need bullets to fucking shoot. Yeah. Absolutely. Same man, thing I, in war, man. I, I, I can't that imagine. Change. I can't imagine the composure it must take to to succeed in that environment, to uh, to survive in that environment. You know, is probably a better way to put it. Not, you know, that's it, it's unbelievable. It's it's really remarkable, man. I, I commend you for that. Yeah, I dude, appreciate thank that. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Like, that's fucking crazy to me. Like, honestly, sitting here at my desk, and we're all sitting here it's unfathomable, you know, the types of things that you guys go through. So thank you. Thank you, brother, man. Yeah. I appreciate that. And Marcelo knows like I've, I've been Marcelo's teammate and kind of biggest fan for years, you know, and like, these are stories that I wanted to share mm-hmm. with the paintball community. Cause that's my community, you know, yeah. like a lot mm-hmm. of guys, like I said, came up as wrestlers. They came up as swimmers. They came up as runners. For me, I was a paintballer. I was a paintballer yeah. and Muay Thai. And that was my, that was what I leaned on for my mental toughness to like, push me through and what i would say tyler is there's like everybody knows well maybe not everybody but there's that term flow state right yeah when when you're in the finals and you've been playing that same spot right where you're going to the corner and then you're going to dorito one dorito two by the end of the tournament you almost know you could kind of mm-hmm. do it with your eyes closed right you just uh, you know you can count your steps you're like all right seven steps i'm gonna wrap <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna bump my next bunker i'm gonna wrap again and yeah. you know, okay, at this time, there might be a guy in snake 50. I got to check that off, right? Mm-hmm. So in war, that is like, and it's almost why some of us come back so crazy. It's like that on steroids. Like, because yeah. you just, you know, your gear down to a T. You know, your buddy's movement down to a T. So mm-hmm. when a firefight breaks out, 
it's like, okay, everybody does their thing. And it's, it's like watching a dance. That's probably the best way I can describe it. It's watching a, a poetic dance of just mm-hmm. everybody doing their right job. That's when everything yeah. goes right. When, when shit goes wrong, then it's terrifying and you just want it to be right again. Yeah, absolutely. And how did you, how did you deal with, like, what was your next step once you heard that come over the radio and you had to obviously, you know, prepare to save your friends essentially, right? Yeah, the, uh, I mean, the, the, the main op I want to talk about is, uh, and it, it's so weird too, because it's, it's not just my story to tell, my, my story to tell. I, like I had, I think 12 of us on that op that night mm-hmm. and uh, some guys are still active. So I don't want to use their, their, their full names here, mm-hmm. but uh, we'll call him my buddy Brando. There was explosions coming out and I'll never forget that it instantly made me laugh because Brandon turns over to me and he's like, hey. He's like, Derek, who is that guy? Is, is he dead? And I'm like looking at this dude next to me and I had seen him. I'd never seen a human being get so flat, like, like face to the ground, hands to the ground, like feet to the ground, just completely flat. And it was our interpreter named Farouk. And he just looks over at me and he goes, no, it's Farouk. I'm okay. And I'm, oh like, my I'm, like, I'm like, hey guys, Farouk's okay. I'm like everything's good. Right. And, uh, and then, yeah, you come up with a plan. You figure out who's shooting at you. You shoot back and you you maneuver on them. One, one of the things I always say is, is take the high ground or it'll take you. Mm. And to like keep this grounded and me not like just, you know, sitting here telling war stories. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, if I threw a rock at you, right? You're going you're gonna to get out of the way, right? If I shoot mm-hmm. a paintball gun at you, you're going to get out of the way. If I shoot real bullets at you, you're going to get out of the way. And you're also going to be terrified. That's, that's mm-hmm. really just... How I'm going to break it down. Uh, and then it's important to know cover and concealment, right? Cover is anything you can hide behind that is going to stop a bullet. Concealment is anything that hides your silhouette, hides your person. So mm. you got to know the difference because concealment doesn't stop bullets. And I'm going to take that one step further is your cover, your concealment and cover changes based on what they're shooting at you, right? Because now mm-hmm. if you start shooting armor piercing bullets, that's no longer cover, that's just concealment. So mm-hmm. I don't care if, like in the movies, you see guys hiding there behind brick walls and stuff. Well, you know, 50 cows go through brick walls. An RPG mm-hmm. goes through a brick wall. So it's like, you got to move. That brick wall is your friend for a minute, but now it's it's shooting rocks at your face and you might get injured just off the, off the ricochet, which is mm-hmm. crazy and something that no video game can prepare you for you start seeing ricochet come at you, you know, their bullets are close. Mm. My God, man. Yeah. That is, yeah. That is so heavy, dude. Yeah. I, I honestly, I cannot even fathom it. Like um, it's, it's, and not, you know, a lot of people listening, they, they think they have an idea about it, but you just don't, you know, you have no, uh, no way of knowing unless you've been in, in that kind of a situation, you know? Yeah, and honestly, it's it's funny like hearing you say that. And obviously, I've I've gotten my pats on the back. I've gotten my combat yeah. awards. I've gotten my you know I've been to my funerals. Like it's mm-hmm. I've lived it. So for me, I'm happy that I got the experiences I have, and I'm grateful that for the most part, um, all my friends made it back. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least in my platoon, I had guys like like Chuck Keating. I got to give him a shout out. He's one of the bravest dudes I ever met. One of the uh, if you don't know who he is, go Google him. Um, Can you say his last seal. name one more time? Keating, K-E-A-T-I-N-G. He's from Arizona too, actually, his family. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, he died in northern Iraq. Man, I'm so bad with years. I want to say 2016. But basically, like, it's, it's just heroism, you know? And mm-hmm. if you're blessed to have those opportunities, man, just pray to your creator and and – trust in all that work you put in that's what i would say to kids that are are still going to war kids are still because like i said the wars they're kind of over but america still has conflicts we still have troops deploying and those guys they might be put in those situations yeah absolutely derek do you mind if we do talk a little bit about that of how you know you you did receive the heroic achievement as a you know automatic weapons gunner um <laughs> yeah. that, that that story seems seems pretty crazy and it's it's incredibly brave and um you know if you don't mind i think the listeners would would like to to listen to that yeah it's a wild one and um like something so i got um navy achievement medal with valor and to me what was important was the valor and not that it's like 
I was any more valorous than the uh, the guys around me because it was it was a mission with all of us, right? I just happened to get noticed that one, and that's the one I wanted to share with you, Marcelo, because you know in paintball sometimes you have those big moves, but like nobody saw it. But you know what happened, you know, you know that yeah. you one balled a guy. And then you just slid like right under a lane and came up and shot the next guy. And to me, I used to always joke with, with, uh, with Robbie, it's like, you're seeing in code. Now you're just, you're mm -hmm. just in the matrix. You're seeing in ones and zeros and you know, what's going to happen next. You have that, like, uh, that anticipation, right? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this, this operation I was on another one in sort of Southwest Afghanistan, we got ambushed. Um, so we're in these mat V's they're armored, they're not Humvees, they're Matvees. They're, they're like Marine M wraps, but the SOCOM variant, the NSW variant, NSW's Naval Special Warfare. And um, we, had, we had gotten a firefight earlier that day, but it was, it was kind of inconsequential, like no casualties on, on our side. Um, and a lot of times they would do that in Afghanistan. They would kind of what I call just spray and pray. They would shoot at us and then they would be gone. Well, this time they were ready. Uh, they were shooting RPGs, machine guns, sniper rifles. Like it was everything that I had ever trained for all happening at once. And there was probably five or six of our vehicles and then the same amount of our partner force, like in between. So we would have an armored Mat V and they would have a, an up armored Humvee, which is, like I said, a different vehicle for the, uh, the Call of Duty kids. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> And my 50 cal malfunctioned. I was on the cruise, the cruise serve remote weapon system, the uh, computer remote weapon system. I don't even remember the acronym right now. I'll have to, yeah. I'll have to get back to you on that. But uh, the crows is what we called it. So I have a, a digital screen and a 50 cal that's on a remote control, which is pretty rad because I'm safe in the turret, right? Shooting my 50 cal and it malfunctions. And, um, I had like two options. I had like, we were in the middle of an ambush and I was like, so okay, I can sit. what does that mean? You're in the middle of an ambush. What's happening right now? Uh, we're just getting shot at from both sides. And it Jeez. was an area that we had already cleared thinking that leaving it was not going to be, we, we didn't expect to get shot at. We thought it was just like, okay, we had already, we had already done our mission for the day, essentially. Yeah. Holy shit, man. But Afghanistan's kind of like that. Like sometimes it's, uh, it's, it can be bad guy country when you didn't expect it to be because the average SEAL mission isn't as much as what the army does where it's, they call it presence patrols where they just like walk the streets and get into firefights. We were a lot more tactical and we were going to a guy's house at night and trying to like either arrest the guy or, or essentially kidnap him in the middle of the night. Who's uh, HVT, a high value target. We were going after mm -hmm. um, like known Taliban fighters or known insurgent fighters. Mm. This was not one of those days. We were supposed to just be like, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, a chill ride home. Like it was supposed to be like, all right, you know, RTB. Yeah, we've done. Return, we, we did our stuff. Let's return to base. Yeah. RTB. Yeah. And that was not RTB. That was not the case. Like we were getting <laughs> oh, shot at shit. a lot, like more than I'd ever been shot at my whole, you know, time I'd been in Afghanistan, which wasn't much at this point. I think I'd been in country for like maybe two months at this point. Well, that, and, uh, that's, a, that's a long time, dude. I mean, especially with the conditions, you know, that's, that is a long time. That's crazy. Yeah. But all, all things considered like this, this firefight was, was significantly um, just worse. Like I said, it was like, it was mm -hmm. like they set up on us and have the drop, which mm -hmm. is not supposed to happen in Navy SEALs. You're not supposed to have the enemy get the drop on you. Yeah. Uh, my 50 cal broke. I popped the hood and, and it was just, it felt like walking onto a paintball field without my mask on like there, there to tie it back to paintball. Like, yeah. and I'm like, imagine you're playing the point without a mask. Like now it's real. Right. Mm. And it was wild because I remember my LPO who's a leading petty officer and I'm, I'm not going to name drop here, but people can uh, contact me if they really want to like fact check my stories. Mm. And uh, they're like, where's it coming from? And I see a sniper round, like go straight into his door. And I was like, well, it's coming from the right for sure, because I just saw your door get shot, you know, and luckily it's armored. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't injured. But if that wasn't an armored vehicle, that round probably would have killed him. Mm. And then I remember getting shot at from this tree line. 
And like I said, in paintball, right? You know, it's like game on, the whistle blows, you know what's going to happen. When people shoot at you and then you have to react to it, it takes your brain a second to like even recognize the sound of bullets like being near you and then hitting your vehicle and whatnot. And I, I got to give props to like the, the Oshkosh and Matt V engineers because our vehicles were like, we literally named them Transformers. You know, it was like Optimus Prime <laughs> and Megatron because these vehicles were built to take a beating. They're built to take IEDs. They're built to take gunfire. They were built to survive a gunfight and an IED explosion. So me popping the turret, the, the hatch was because I wanted to fix my weapon and shoot back essentially, you know, it's like my gun's down. I knew what I needed to do. It's like, I had to like take off my barrel, swab it and, mm -hmm. and fix it. Right. And all my, all my boys are like, dude, you know, like not necessary right now, like just like survive and we'll get through this. But in my mind, I'm like, dude, it's this battle right now. We don't know like what's worse. Like, and you know, how do we know we don't take an IED strike and like definitely need the, the 50 cal running right now? So I was, I was determined to get it fixed. I fixed the 50 cal under fire and, and returned fire and everything was good. You know, it was like, how did you fix it? What was going on with it? Oh, um, a failure to feed. And like, so we had this, um, try to visualize it. Mm -hmm. You have a feed tray and a shoot that goes into the 50 cal. Yeah. And then just from shooting a lot, either sometimes it feeds like at an angle and then the next, the bolt will come forward, right? And it's like, it's essentially like chopping, but not because, you know, with real yeah. guns, it's it's not a chop, it's a malfunction. It's like either a stove pipe or a round is just like not loaded correctly, right? That's right, yeah. So I remember I never felt like so much like a turtle, right? Because oh, I had, oh. I always carried this extra um, CLP on me, this lubricant, and I popped the hatch and all I needed to do was lube it, rack it, and then slap the feed tray and I was good. Like I had to do like three things and I'm still getting shot at, mind you, like while I'm trying to do this. And I'm like lubing it like this, like trying to get as yeah. small as I can. And just like, I don't like to cuss a lot, but you kind of have to in war. And I'm like literally telling myself, I'm like, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> I gotta lube, gotta lube, gotta lube. Rounds are hitting my vehicle, cracking over my head. And um, it sounds like a whip, like cracking above your head every time a round like flies over you. I get my 50 cal fix, long story short, I returned fire with my Mark 48, which was my personal machine gun that I carried. Uh, it's a 762 saw. And um, yeah, rack it, close it. And then once you're back on the gun inside the truck and using the crows, the remote weapon system, then you're you're playing Call of Duty again. It's rad. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Jeez, man. So that was that, that was so like crazy. my that was the one story that I was recognized for where I wanted to share with like the audience. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell all of them because talking to a combat vet about who he's killed and how many combat ops he went mm -hmm. on is a lot like asking you about like your honeymoon and like what happened, mm -hmm. you know, after you guys yeah. kiss and back, you know what I mean? It's like, these are my personal stories That's right. and my platoon stories that I'm not always like ready to share, but. Yeah, no, we, we, and the listeners, man, I appreciate you so much for, for just being here and sharing your time with us. Um, because bro, you, you are a, a savage. You are a, uh, a, a valor, uh, I don't know how to say it properly, but valorous, just, just like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, like I, I'm not, I'm not doing a good job here, but like, uh, you get received a medal of valor, right? So you, um, yeah. Yeah. And I used to always tell my, uh, my wife, if I die, all I'm really trying to say is dude, thank you like straight up like dude that shit gives me the chills just sitting here it's crazy yeah, it was a wild night but like any other day of the week it was um it was just it's just you're doing your job right and mm -hmm. you know that'd be like you saying tyler that was awesome that you shot the snake you know you're like i, I yeah. shoot the snake a lot that's what i do in paypal like yeah but i was i was stoked because really i was just lucky that my my lpo I saw me fixing it and, and wrote, because that's another thing that's weird about war, man. You not only do you have to do the, the heroic act or valorous act or whatever, somebody else has to write a witness statement saying, yes, I saw this happen. And like, yeah, yeah. and then they submit that off. It's not like the movies where you like come back and like, no. there's a ceremony, they put it on your chest. Like other dudes gotta be like, yeah, it was a shitty one. Thank God Derek was there. You know? Yeah. That, yeah to like me, that was, that my hands there. are legitimately sweating right now. Like <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like sweating. My hands are like soggy. You know what I mean? Like just, <laughs> just putting myself in your shoes for one second. And I feel like this and yeah, it's just, I'm just so grateful for you guys, man. That's, that's unreal. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, and Derek, we can talk about the book, right? Can we talk about the book. Yeah. So just, my, my end goal 
And I mean, a lot of SEALs have written books, right? Then there's a lot of paintballers in the world, but there's not a lot of Navy SEAL paintballers that want to write a book, you know? Yeah, I only no. know like one paintballer that I can think of that wrote a book. It's called like Paintball IQ or something lame. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> my yeah, what, story, a, what a jackass, huh? <laughs> my story is Aftermath to Afghanistan, and I, I, I'm debating on a subtitle or not between a Navy SEAL story or just a warrior's tale, you know? But it's it, the title is definitely Aftermath to Afghanistan. That's my plug and my shout out. Yeah, that's, and, um, that's awesome. Wow. My goal is to, to, to help combat vets. You know, PTSI is a big message of mine. And a lot of people told me I was wasting my time playing paintball. Or You're wasting your time. You're wasting. I'm like, well, dude, I went on to be a Navy SEAL. And I can say that, you know, I've, I've stand on the same grinder as Jocko, Goggins, Eddie Gallagher. And these guys all, they, they all know me. Maybe not Jocko because he's an officer, but mm -hmm. uh, Eddie definitely knows me. And I'm like, hey, man. At the end of the day, we're all Navy SEALs. Paintball is valid, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Paintball yeah, is valid. Yeah. It, it, deserves, mm -hmm. it deserves a shine amongst like elite athletes, in my opinion. I yeah. couldn't agree more, man. I think that paintball still has so far to go to, to get the credibility that it deserves because it is truly a difficult game to play. And um, it's the sport of war, you know? It's the only actual sport of war and I think that, um, you know, there's just, there's just so much credibility that it's missed, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if Maddie coined it or not, but I'm going to go with my own of like combat yoga and also call it like fluga, you know? There we go. Cause it, it's flow and it's, it's, you're moving your body in dynamic ways that you don't do in any other sport. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yoga um, is huge for paintball and like just flexibility and being able to to kind of contort your body, you know, to get in all these weird bunkers that we have to be into. For sure. And like the, when I, when I tell that like turret gunner story, cause a lot of, a lot of my buddies obviously were there and remember that story of me in Afghanistan. Um, I draw back to like aftermath. I really do. And it might sound corny and people might like try and discredit it, but I'm like, no, hundred percent. If you can run and gun to the Dorito corner and kill your mirror and then wrap on the home or wrap on the back center and shoot that guy too, you have like a 70 to 80% chance of winning that point. If you got those first few kills and you're the only dude on the field that knows that now mm -hmm. your job is tell your team, Hey, kill the back, right. Kill the home and take off to the races in my opinion and shoot as many other dudes as you can. And mm -hmm. it's like, you get in that, that mindset of like, if, if a happens, B is definitely going to happen. And if B happens, then it's called, um, if this cre creating, that. creating wind conditions essentially. Right. Yeah. Like, what is, what is the win condition to win this point? Like, who, who do we need to shoot next to turn this point in from a losing point to a winning point? Mm. And you realized you needed to get that gun back I need up. to get my, you yeah, I need to get, get my 50 cal working. Was, I, wasn't, was, I, wasn't, yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't getting any pats on the back, you know? I was getting bitched out later and having my job and the team's question, probably. You know, like, are you, are you fit to be here, man, if you can't fix the 50 cal under pressure? I mean, that's at best, right? That's at best yeah. in that scenario if you don't get it up. You know, there's there's a reality of of what could have happened. Yeah. I love Goggins. Uh, I always say Goggins should be sponsored by Viagra because he's always stay hard. <laughs> get it's, hard. It's, <laughs> hey, my, my slogan is stay sharp, you know, stay yeah. sharp like a blade. Yeah. yeah. Keep that okay. keep that sharp edge. Nobody, what, what's a dull knife good for? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Stay yeah, sharp. Absolutely. Yeah. You can beat someone with a dull knife, maybe, you know. So it's, I guess, it'd yeah. be really, really tough, really tough process. Yeah. You gotta be sharp. I like that. Stay sharp hundred percent with, with everything, right. With everything you do, stay sharp on it. You want quick on your feet, quick in your mind. Um, just sharp, sharp movements. I like that a lot. Be able to cut be a good teammate. Stuff. Right. Ah, yes. We talked about, about this before the show. You're right. Yes. Be a good teammate, man. Absolutely. Let's elaborate on that. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to give you, you know, it's, it's my turn to like give you your shine. I remember seeing you, I want to say, help me out with the year, man. It was the first Huntington Beach in the sand. Did you play that one or did you oh, play yeah. the next one? I was, I was there. Um, and your play was, was that the I, year you beat, I, won the one-on-one -on -one or was it the next year? No, that, um, the first Huntington Beach that I went to, I think I was still on Twisted for that very first one. And then I won the one-on-one -on -one in Denver, Denver against Zyza. Oh, Denver. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, no, I'm talking about um, Huntington Beach, uh, probably 2004 then. Were okay. you with Oakland? Um, 
in 2004 I was with Oakland. Yeah. There it is. I was playing with Naughty by Nature. Okay. And I remember seeing you in an Oakland jersey or Bob jersey, whatever it was, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, oh, that's cool, dude. Bob has a kids team. Like maybe, uh, maybe I'll like try out. And, and I'm like, and then I saw you step on the field and chrono in. And I'm like, that dude's pro? What the heck? And I was like, literally blew my mind. I was yeah, like, you still look to like, this day. I don't just know. Just like the youngest. And I'll never forget, you had the biggest, like curliest smile back then. Like you're just always, no matter what you're doing, you, you wore like, um, I don't even think you had like a sandana. I remember you having like an athletic headband. That's it's right. Like a, an athletic sweatband and you're just always smiling like i'm just stoked yeah. to be here man like oh, whatever man. we're doing i'm happy yeah i i'm dude honestly to this day i still think about what happened in the central valley and how i got on oakland at that age and i'm like how in the hell did that even happen and yeah. and like yeah i'm uh i'm super fortunate my mom is from santa cruz so she's like a hippie right and and my dad's from iowa and he's a ranger so my mom would, you know, give me that, that big, bright energy. And my dad would kind of keep me checked and humbled and tear me down a little and make sure I'm headed in the right direction, but always smiling. Definitely. Yeah. Like I said, I was just blown away. I was like, Oh, Bob has a kid's team. And I'm like, Oh no, that's, that's just Tyler playing with the big boys, you know, good for him. Dude, they were beating my ass for the first few years. I'll tell you, they're kicking the crap out of me. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's fun though, man. That's what it's all about. You gotta, you know, you gotta play the game and uh, whether, even if you're losing, you keep playing, you know? Hey, yeah. It's not over until either the buzzer rings or everyone's dead, right? That's it. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Keep working hard. Hmm. Absolutely, man. Look, I, I think I want to revert back to um, being a good teammate because uh, it's something that can, that can really help you get through life in all scenarios. Right. And, and in your situation, Derek, it was, you know, truly life or death being a good teammate. Right. And so fortunately in, in much of the world, it's not life or death, but it can really help you um, achieve a lot of great things to be a good teammate. And um, what does that mean to be a good teammate? Right. And I think you can relate this in your scenario and in, in the sense that, that, you know, we're all talking about trying to do things that help the people around you succeed as well right? It's kind of a selfless act. And um, I think you see a lot of people kind of walk through life with this really selfish tone where it's all about them because they want to get the best for themselves and they want to achieve the best things. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it pays off for people um, in that one thing. I'm sure there's a lot of other things that, that, that don't work for them. But I think the way you really get success is you help the people around you do well. You help the people around you succeed. You help the people around you be happy and live better lives and, and just achieve things that they want to achieve. And in turn, you grow along the way you achieve success, you, you know, walk the path that you want to path want to walk by doing that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And I think there, there's something to be said for leadership too. I always told people um, never stray away from an opportunity to lead, whatever it is, if you're, cause you're not always given those opportunities and make or break, you're going to learn something about yourself. And I always did. I was, I was young in the SEAL teams and I was young in paintball and I was my second platoon. So after Afghanistan, I got back, I had dudes that were like 33 when I was 28 and I was leading them. I was the combat veteran. I was the guy with experience. I was the sniper. I was the free fall jump master in my platoon. It was my job to make sure this dude who's older than me was squared away doing all those things. And keep in mind, this is a Navy, Navy SEAL. Like he's, he's a badass in his own right. And it was my job to like give him orders with, with direction because that's one of the things we pride ourselves on is, is thinking shooters we're not just you know exposable grunts and, and nothing to take away from the marine corps or the army it's just like we established it's a different it's a different selection process and it's a different mindset there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. yeah absolutely man it's um it's a tough thing you see you know I, I wonder what it comes from because some people just naturally have that ability you know, and, and, um, some don't, I wonder if it's a family thing growing up, you know, the type of love you get from your parents or, or type of teaching, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I, I just feel like there's definitely some individuals that naturally gravitate towards wanting to lead, wanting to, um, be a good teammate, wanting to, to care about the people around them, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I got to share my combat story with you guys and there's, 
there's a lot of them now because of like YouTube and, and social media. There's a lot more veterans that are talking about war, which I think is healthy. And, and like I, I said, that's why I like the term PTSI, the injury, because it's a disorder if you label a disorder and then you, you kind of like, it'd be like if you, you write it off on a run, right? You hurt your knee on a run. You're like, well, I can't, I can't run anymore. I have PTSD knee, you know, like my knee's broken. From my <laughs> last. I'm like, totally. oh, come on, dude. Like we, we experience stressful things. Yeah. You know, you might have nightmares, you might have flashbacks, but like, you got to learn to deal with those. You got to be functioning with society because, mm-hmm. you know, take it from me, man. I'll, I can sit here and tell you all my accolades, but the stuff that's hard to talk about is like, I got divorced. I, I lost my girlfriend. I, you know, I burned bridges with friends because I was aggressive and didn't know how to like bring myself back down to center. And I was lucky to make it back with all my limbs and eyesight, dude. Not, not everybody did. I have friends that lost their life. I have friends that lost their eyes. And, you know, you really want to support a veteran, go to a hospital with amputees and, and put your time in, dude, help a veteran walk again or help a veteran go surfing. There's, there's a program called Surf Rider, I believe is a program. Uh, and to me, like those guys deserve the ultimate hats off. They literally take combat veterans that have been in IED strikes or whatever the case may be and just get them out in the water surfing. Yeah. And like, I, I don't think there's a more noble cause right now if you want to support the veteran community. Absolutely, man. And wow. what are you doing? What If you can uh, kind of tell us what you do right now in the building that you're at and what's it called and all those kind of yeah. details. Uh, for sure. Uh, two things. First, I got to give a shout out to Ryan Martin and Oath hey, because we have a yeah. we have a clothing brand and there's two Ryan Martins. I always got to like, I always got to do this because there's the legacy Ryan Martin and then the dynasty entourage. I'm always talking about legacy Ryan Martin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gary Shows, Nick Shows, mm-hmm. uh, Sitting Ducks, Rusty Glaze, yeah. a company called the Oath Movement. So you can go online and check it out. And uh, we're working on the Instagram as we speak. And uh, basically me and Ryan decided a while back that we want to help veterans. Both of us had had a experience in clothing before. I worked with HK on Meta Threads. You know, I got to give a shout out to Marky and Jay there too. Whoa, whoa. But, what um, did you work with them on that? <laughs> what, what was oh going man, on? that's a, like, that'd be a whole nother podcast getting into my, my, my experience with HK. But I helped them get the Cloud9 account, which yeah. Cloud9 Gaming was huge. They had Team Secret at the time. So I got to give them their due credits Mm -hmm. but um basically i was trying to partner with hk on their first like line of gaming clothing and i invested in the company gave them a loan to buy their sublimation machine that they made those jerseys with that's crazy yeah so i love them marky always takes care of me jay always takes care of me i kind of have like an unofficial lifetime sponsor from hk because they if i really need the gear they're gonna hook me up you know what i mean yeah and i love those guys for that Mm-hmm. So anyways, back to where I'm at in 2021, right? That's the year mm-hmm. we're in. Um, I'm part of a program called Triple Threat. And there's two things that I'm working towards getting. Uh, it's, it's strictly combat veterans, which to me is amazing. So if you're a combat veteran, like I said, and you need a support group, it's called Triple Threat and reach out. Um, Beautiful. We'll check your credentials. And it's, it's really not even that strict. Like you don't have to be a fucking super heroic Navy SEAL. Basically, if you served in combat operations between Iraq or Afghanistan, or even we have a Vietnam guy who's rad. His name's Jack. And he'd probably laugh if he knew I was talking about him on a paintball <laughs> podcast, but we literally have a Vietnam Hey, guy. hey, hey, what's wrong with a paintball podcast? Well, it's, no, no, just, just check it out. Cause we sit in groups, right? Like um, yeah. it's, it's, it's not AA, but it's very similar. It's like, it's, it's um, founded on the principles of AA of like dealing with PTSD and being like, uh, what's the right term here? Like a veteran reacclimating to society, right? Because mm-hmm. you come back from war and you got to learn how to be a human being again, right? Like there's mm-hmm. not a lot of jobs out there unless I want to be like a super mall cop or, you know, a, a, a shooting instructor, which I teach, by the way, also I teach Muay Thai and shooting um, oh, wow. to kind of help nice. pay I gotta, the bills. And- I got to come down and train with you. Yeah, for sure. Mouse, mouse is one of my students and mouse is nasty. I'm, I'm going to keep preaching that yeah. to the day I die. Yeah. Yeah. You put good. Alex Goldman in a ring and give him like three months of solid training. And he's a fighter. No doubt in my mind, mm-hmm. whether or not he can take all the punches in the nose. Cause he's got a, you know, he's got his physique and his, his appearance. <laughs> he's got to work on. I don't know, but mouse has the heart. No doubt. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, he's a beast. Pitbull. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I'm at, I'm at VBSD. It's in San Diego. We're right by Old Town. I'm like walking distance from Old Town, if you know where that cool. is. Cool. Yeah, yeah, dude. And it's I'm, essentially I'm born and raised in San Diego, bro. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm not. I'm a transplant, dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm Orange exactly. County kids till the day I die. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 
there's two programs. There's WASU that I'm working towards too. It's um, working with, I don't even think this one's just veterans. I think this is, I'm not sure to be honest, I'll get back to you, but um, it's like pool therapy. And then the second one is a triple threat. It's a meeting I go to that I'm the secretary of and I've organized with other veterans. Wow, dude, so spectacular. Yeah. Spectacular, but, man. Um, still interested in apparel and I might go back to school for either graphic design and pursue that again. Or I've thought about um, possibly being a paramedic. So I got I got some some things in the hopper right now. You know, I got some yeah. I got awesome. some some stuff awesome. spinning around because uh, my dream would be to be a published author, uh, have the oath movement, like pay the bills. But apparel, it's a tough industry, man. Like yes. I, I again, dude, hats off to HK because if you know the HK story, those yeah. guys started off making headbands and long sleeves, and now they're mm -hmm. one of the biggest paintball companies, if not the biggest in the world. You know, absolutely. Yeah pretty wild what those guys have done from headbands and long sleeves yeah they banded together and never never looked back you know never looked back and for right or wrong you know they never looked back yeah no hormesis never. too is rad gotta give hormesis a shout out if i if i could have my headband company it would be hormesis so they already did it you know yeah <laughs> for sure yeah, yeah. They're, doing, you know? they're doing a fantastic job as well yeah okay. they're doing it right i do have this concept and maybe i should just say it on here but um it's kind of like one of those like golden egg ideas um i think we should have like an rfid chip in a headband that you can scan and it says all your tournaments played it says your appa right it says who owned that head so say i got like an oliver laying headband from 2005 and then it's passed on and you know it's lineage because it's all in there on a on a qr code that you can just scan on your phone that's <laughs> that'd amazing be tight. <laughs> that'd be tight come on dude whoever's that'd out there in podcast land make yeah, it happen and, that'd be you know, tight throw me Throw me a bone, man. Yeah. I'm not asking yeah. for much. <laughs> that is a golden egg right there. I like yeah, that. I told I told Frazy this already. So if, if somebody okay. else invents it first, I'm gonna All see right. him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Intellectual property theft, baby. You heard it here first. That's Play right. Podcast. This is Derek Janish's idea. Yeah, dude. Yep. Correct. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and some trans and some trans fees. Doesn't it like every member on the podcast get like a box of trans fees? What's up? What's up? Dude, do you want some trans fees? Oh yeah, we got you. Dude, we got plenty. I want some trans. I want some trans fees. I want some CBD, and, uh, and I want a, I want a headband from Marcel. Those are, those are my terms. Okay, there we go. so the headband ties <laughs> in because because for the listeners, um, a headband that I finally retired. I talk about this headband in this Sandana. I've I I almost every World Cup I've played in it, I've won. And then I don't, I don't use it for a while and I pull it right. out. Like I retired it for a long time and I pulled it out 2015. We won world cup, the sand, mm -hmm. the whole deal. I'm like, okay, it's special. And Derek gave me this, uh, venom. It's venomware, right? I don't know the, the terminology of the skull. It was the one with the skulls on it that everyone. It's one of the OG yeah. venomwares. Like, like I, I know I could sell it for like 500 bucks at least. You know, I'm like, <laughs> It's like it's a 12 yeah. ounce or is it a 14 ounce? I don't even know. Tell all the, mm -hmm. the nerds that, that know that. We got to we gotta weigh it. <laughs> um, yeah, you got to weigh it, bro. It, I it, think doesn't weigh what, it doesn't weigh what it used to. It's missing fabric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Venom Warrior nerds would know. And the, yeah. it had the right time. It had all the pedigree. For, it like, did, cool exactly. It was, it was the <laughs> one. I, I mean, dude, it's it. I keep it in my gear bag now as like a lucky charm. So I don't wear it anymore because literally it's about to – the the tails are about to break off. It's got the PB fashion stamp on it now that I put on it a long time ago. Get that get that thing sewn up, dude. Send it to Ollie and get some hormesis, you know. I know. Swagger. You know what? I, I think I'm going to, but on again, it's so torn, like it it would become a transformer, which maybe it'd be kind of cool. I should revamp it. But yes, dude, you 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 dig in it headband. I owe you a headband. So yes, I'm gonna bring you some transfuse, some heel brand and a headband. I promise you. And, and you're here. Did you ever ask yourself? Did you ever ask yourself, why is Derek giving me this headband? Of all the other kids on the team, why is he specifically giving me this headband? Did, you, did that ever pop in your head? Because uh, there was intentions behind that headband. Well, let's hear to, this. To be honest, I don't know if I was old enough to have that type of comprehension. I knew that you and Goldman were going pro. There was no doubt in my mind. I was like, these two kids are going to be the next nastiest paintball players ever. Like, no doubt in my mind. I saw it in you. I saw it in Alex. And the next person I would probably say that about was Ray. Like I was just, I was blown away by, by Ray's like ability. Sometimes his it's snap nasty. shooting, yeah. his snap shooting was better than anybody on the team. I'll, I'll, I'll say that all day. You know, mm -hmm. I was good. Cause I was sandbagging. I had already played, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we're talking about D3 here. Let's keep this, let's keep this all in perspective. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs>
But no, I mean, if we're if we're gonna do the podcast thing and, and give you your props, man, you had heart back then. I knew I knew you wanted to be a pro paintballer, and there's a difference between knowing it and then knowing that this kid also has the determination to get it done. Two different yeah. things. Oh, when this guy things. sets his mind to something, it's over. You know, it it doesn't matter what it is. He, he gets hyper focused on something, and it's done. It's a done deal. <laughs> For better or worse, sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> better or worse. For better. Hey, or worse. dude, ride or die, right? Ride or die. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Derek, what do you think is like the most difficult aspect of paintball, and like maybe but, something that the listeners could uh, kind of get some value out of in that aspect there? Are we talking like in a game, like going yeah, pro? Like in, a, in a paintball match, just just like playing a paintball game. What do you think is the most difficult aspect that players have to jump over out there? <laughs> I got you. I'm snake off the break more than three points in a row. <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's why that's why mouse is the goat i'll tell you i'll tell you right now I'll, I'll line up with any five dudes to play paintball but if you ask me to go stick off the break three or four points in a row mm-hmm. by point three i'm kind of hoping that somebody else like wants to do that job you know <laughs> like, sure. yeah. yeah yeah mouse is, is and, a beast with the way he can just relentlessly attack over and over and over and over and over here, yeah. here's the thing mouse mouse has still has a whole nother career on the dorito side if you ask me it's not like sure, it's not like he's sure, it's not sure, like he's sure. bad down the Doritos. Yeah. It's not like he doesn't know what needs to happen there. Yeah, absolutely. You no, put he, you put Greg Sowers and Mouse head to head in the Doritos. I'm still putting my money on Mouse like all day. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I, 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 mean, I love I love me some Greg, but you know, we talk about it. We talk about it on the show a lot. That really at the highest levels, the game's actually positionless. You do have on on teams um, like. Billy Bernacci plays a snake all the time for X Factor, but that fool can go and attack on the Dorito side. If you're an attacker, you know how to attack, you know, and, right. and at the highest levels with that experience, like it's rare that you find the elite players in the league. They can play all over the field, you know, yeah. they, you only see them in their respective position with their team. Um, but yeah, you that put that player, Yeah, you put them anywhere else and they're going to get it done there as well. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it's funny. I play the snake side on dynasty now. Yeah. As the two, but I, I played the Dorito side as the one, my whole career, you know? And it's mm-hmm. like, it's, it's just knowing paintball, right. You know, it, Tyler, when, when dynasty in 2019 did really well in Philly, you were the one on the snake side. Actually, we were a really mm-hmm. skeleton crew and like, everyone was blown away like what's tyler doing over on the- bro he's been playing <laughs> you can't paintball. Do that. he's been yeah. playing paintball for 20 years he can do it just fine you know like yeah. there's um yeah. it, it is a positionless game when you get into the higher levels you know mm-hmm. yeah and i need like we talk about this on the show i need at, at any given point in time this player here is going to become my dorito guy or my snake guy like i need you to be yeah. able to just shape shift into whatever player i need you to be in that moment if i lose a couple guys here i need you to fill that and be that so we got to make sure that we're all we're all able to do that but all right if we're if we're bringing this back to athletics and um you know that that championship caliber mindset Uh the snake is the only position on the field that has to crawl on his belly like repeatedly Mm -hmm. and those are engaging uh different muscles and a different part of your brain in my opinion because you're getting all your information from everybody else and mm-hmm. just getting a quick snapshot of the game. The Dorito guy is on his feet, ideally the whole game, right? Like he mm-hmm. might slide into his bunker. He might be on a knee, but for the most part, he has what we call that situational awareness. The snake mm-hmm. guy is crawling on his buddy belly. So he's engaging more of his abs, more of his core. He's in the he trenches. Has to, he has to get his information from the guys behind him. So not only does he have to be physically adept, he has to be emotionally adept to like stay calm and trust his teammates behind him. And then he has to have this thing that I coined called paintball IQ. He has to know what has to happen. (laughs) He has to happen, like know what's going to happen in the game next, right? He has to know what bunkers he needs to check off, when he should trade, when he should stop. All all three of those things are happening at once. Whereas I know from experience that Dorito guy can sit in the corner the whole game and still have a great game. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I think that. I don't think the Dorito guy can sit in the corner. I I actually, well, Okay, it depends. It's situational. I think there's feel there's times where a snake player can do the same thing, you know. Right. Um, it, it's it's kind of timing. What I do agree with for sure is that yes, their head is down, so they rely so much on the two on that side, right, to get information and to be able to listen, which is a different part of the game. Whereas you're right, like on the Dorito side, 
as a Dorito player, I can see a lot of what's going on. When I, di- when I get into the snake, it's like, please tell me what's going on, guys. Like, I'm trying to hear. I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to figure things out. But I don't have great vision on the field. You know, and so teamwork really becomes a big part of it. Trusting your team, getting good information from your two. This is why I think the two on the snake side is probably one of the more demanding roles on a paintball field because you are so responsible for your one and how they play and their comfortability. Um, and then you also have to be able to play that spot, right? But as a as a as a one on the snake side, um, it's definitely the most physically demanding position mm-hmm. there is. I mean, think about it this way. If you took all like the Keith Brown, you took the Alex Goldman, you took um, all the top snake players, all those guys are going to do well on the Dorito side. But if we reverse that, right? If you take all the Dorito players and the back center guys and make them snake in the one on impact or make them one in the snake on damage, is damage going to be as effective as a team? That's that's what I'm proposing. You, mm-hmm. you know where, so you're right with that, but you know where I think there's a difference? Um, and, and I truly believe this. And Tyler, maybe, maybe you can, you can uh, give your opinion on this. You take those, those ones on the snake side, and they can go and play the Dorito side, and they can do it. Uh, and I'm, let's talk about the elites. Let's talk about Mouse, um, Keith, uh, you know, the, the top snake players, Chad, George. You put them over on the Dorito side. They will still do it better than most, but they won't do it as, as well as they play the snake. Um, and w- the difference that I think there is, is I think when you play the snake, you have to have something about your mental fortitude that says, fuck it sometimes, excuse my language. And you just kind of close your eyes and go and you make a move. And it's, it's, you're not, you're not guessing you have this intuition, the Dorito side, so many times it's much more methodical and you have to think precisely because the other team can stop almost every single move. So you have to know who you have to put in, put that person in, you have to win a gunfight to make it to the next spot. Right. You have to like have some sort of you have to use your this technical ability to get down the field and actually earn the 50. Whereas in the snake, often it could be set up by game plan. You know, your 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 back guy shoots the snake corner. You do make the snake on the break. It's very easy to go down and shoot four people. You look like a superhero, but really, that's actually a very easy thing to do. And and, and again, I'm not taking away from from the snake players because there's a lot of times where that's not the case and they save games. But that's the position that gets the shine the most when other teammates are actually doing the job, you know, and it's, it's like a systematic thing. Like if I make the snake on the break and my team shot the corner and I could crawl the way down, the game's over. I'm going to shoot four people and it's over. It's a, it's not a skill thing. It's a decision. It's a predetermined thing that I'm like, well, I know my job. It's charger crawl down, wrap, but I easily shoot four people, you know, whereas on the Dorito side, I feel like you have to really work for those kills a lot more. In, in, in a lot of sense well it's w- with the way they've set the bunkers up now more than ever you know they have we got six car washes on this five man field you know we would have <laughs> that too, yeah. yeah we we would have seven a, a man two- bunkers on a five man field exactly yeah, yeah. so now I, I really think that marcelo hit it on the head with uh you know every single move down the dorito there's there's at least one or two people that are stopping you and a lot of the time and with the snake, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have people stopping you as well. But I think that the way that they've designed it now is more crash them, bash them um, on, on that side snake side. Sure. Yeah. yeah. They're just running each other over over there. Yeah. I, I yeah, know. It made me think. Um, sorry. I, w- I want to no, get the story ahead. out too. Yeah. It's, uh-huh. it's story time. I guess. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was thinking about when I played for Naughty by Nature and man, I got to give Bear the shout out there because he put that together with Giovanni, the, you know, the godfather paintball. Yeah, and I don't know what Bear's title is, but it's Bear. There's only one Bear Digidio. <laughs> and um, one thing I always did that a lot of guys, even teammates of mine, made fun of me is I used to walk the fields in full gear. I would walk the fields with my elbow and knee pads yeah. on. The reason being is I was usually going to the snake or the 50 Dorito, and I wanted to slide on that turf and know what my slide was going to be like. Absolutely. And we beat we beat two pretty big teams. We beat the Naughty Dogs in Huntington Beach, and we beat Diesel. And I rem- I'll never forget. I get every time I see Rainy. I always remind him that I shot him that tournament when he was playing with uh, Greg Pauly and Diesel, and I was on Naughty Dogs with Bear, or Naughty by Nature with Bear, excuse me. Yeah. Right, but it was because I'd walked the field before, and I knew exactly where I needed to run and dive to, like, slide in where there's just, you couldn't get shot. If you were fast enough, the slide was going to carry you into the snake, and all you had to do from there is pop up and shoot the right dudes, and you look like a hero, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I love that being out there with the gear on and everything. Love that. Yeah, man. And you know, in in the SEAL teams, we call it like train like you fight. 
If I, yeah. if I, if I carry that piece of equipment with me into combat, I need to be able to rucksack like 12 miles with that piece of equipment, even if it's a battery. And you're like, what do you mean a battery? Some of our batteries weigh like some ungodly amount of weight, like 10 pounds or something ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, everybody thinks we have these cool like Iron Man suits. Not always. Sometimes you have some old school technology that's just heavy. And yeah. because mostly because of encryption, but like I don't I don't want to get too much into radio and comms, comms nerd, nerd stuff. That's what that is. <laughs> totally. Hey, I like that kind of stuff. That's uh that's the nuts and bolts of everything, right? All that kind of good stuff. Yeah, but you know, know your gear, know your equipment. That's that's another thing that always blew my mind about paintballers. Is the first thing I always did is I'll pick up their gun, and put it in my shoulder, and like their ASA would be like it would swivel. It'd be. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, dude. I'm like, how do you like? Do you do you stop that like this? Nuts. Like, what yeah. are you doing here? You know, yeah. that thing needs to be an extension of your forearm and your grip. It needs to feel right. It needs to feel mm -hmm. right in your hands. Like it needs to feel like home. And when you put in your shoulder, you might have to sit there for five, six, seven minutes just shooting a lane. So you want to be able to do that with as least amount of skeletal muscle as possible. And when yeah. you go to sniper school, it's literally the same exact thing. Like they, they call them non-standard shooting positions. It's literally the same thing that I had already done in paintball. Mm. That's, that's so funny. Do you remember when we would have like rails and then your ASA <laughs> yeah, would course. attach to the rail and you have the hose going in there? <laughs> yeah. Macro, that was my favorite thing about paintball back then. If we're going to do yeah. paintball nostalgia time is yeah. you were always in the game. It doesn't matter. It could have been a five on one. You're still in the game because one dude's about to blow a macro line. The other guy's <laughs> popper is about to go down. Like, like just, just hang in the game, baby. One dude's hang about to there. blow a macro line. <laughs> yeah, because I'd hear, I'd be in the snake, like terrified, but then all of a sudden you're like, <laughs> and you're like, get him, dude, get him. <laughs> I know, I know that sound. That's hilarious. That's amazing. Many, That's many a times. We've come a long way, man. We've come a long way. We've come a lot. That was oh, yeah. so. When I came back to paintball, I, I left in 2005. I played one in Huntington Beach in 06, <laughs> and then I think the next event I really played was that Huntington Beach with Brad. Uh, shout out to Beaster, Brad Mon. Yeah, Beast. Two on two. Me and Brad lost to Tyler and LJ in the yeah. Huntington Beach. Um, <laughs> I took third in that, which I was pretty proud of, man. We we did there was we did competition. Decent. Yeah, it was competition. But well, I, I was like, what? You came, you came in ahead of Yosh and Alex. I, you said it, not me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we, we had a pretty good bracket, you know? Uh, yeah. we, we had Brad might have Brad might have hooked us up on our bracket or something. There was some magic <laughs> in our bracket. <laughs> that was so that was so much fun, man. And that was that that was the last Huntington Beach event. That was ever. it, man. I was yeah. at the first one, I was at the last, and I'm like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that's tight. I miss something. Um, Those were great. But what I was Me getting too. back to is I was like, no macro lines and speed feeds. I was like, this is enough, dude. I'm back. I'm in it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you guys got the me sold feed. up. I don't know how none of us thought of a speed Hold feed on. in 2005. Do you guys remember the speed feed with the claws? Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, those, those shout, out to, shout out to Virtue. But hey, talk about innovation, right? Like, yeah. Those, I think Virtue was the first to make them. I, I think. Well, they, actually, oh, that, little that John Mark. The ugly hopper. Dude, LJ Marquez showed up to an Oakland practice with a with a garbage disposal okay, on the top. Yeah, of... yeah, I remember that. I do remember. Yeah. That. yeah. Who exactly? Because Marcel was giving me crap later for saying he was the greatest coach ever of all time. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, I, whatever I called him. <laughs> yeah, LJ LJ was definitely a rock star, and mm -hmm. like, dude, he did more of an engineer a... creator. So good job with the speed feed. That doesn't make you the best coach ever, there, Derek. <laughs> But he's definitely uh, underrated. I'll give him that. Like LJ, yes, yes. LJ knows his shit. Like he would, he would pull me to the side and I have to give him a ton of credit for my success and like knowing how to play paintball well, because he really hardwired me well on how to play the game, how to approach situations, like the fundamentals of playing the game of paintball. LJ really took me under his wing when I was on Oakland with him there. So and he, yeah, he was innovative. He didn't have a, a sweat gland, bro. He, he, he couldn't sweat. That's what blew my mind. That's crazy. And he was playing at the highest level. He would, Bob Long had a pond. LJ would go dip into the pond and come back weighing 60 pounds of water and go oh, and really? run around outside out of Bob Long's house. Yeah. <laughs> All you kids that are complaining that you're not winning because you don't have your transfuse or because, you <laughs> yeah. know. <laughs> like whatever your excuse is, like keep that in mind. Keep LJ yeah. in mind. If you don't have to, do you want transfuse or not? <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Don't, don't take the transfuse off the table yet, baby. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm just using that as an example because I know yeah. there's kids out there. I see so many of these kids, and you know who you are. We're like, you have seven different kinds of like JT Pro Flex masks, and mm -hmm. like you've never even won a tournament. I'm like, bro, if you have more than two masks and you haven't won an event yet, and you're you call yourself a tournament paintball player, you got to take a step back and look at reality. Damn. Hold on. You know what? You know what? <laughs> no, listen, I got to push back on that. Yeah. Because, oh, here we go. Because Shocking. I'm gonna major shout out to High Tone, LA Vibe, all those. <laughs> Yeah. I actually think that it's so so cool that they are flossing out there. Like oh, every flossing. I think you're, you're right. They got to win some events. That's fine. That'll come. But I think it's they <laughs> they they brought like glamour to paintball. I didn't think it was possible. Like they mm -hmm. li, like HK brought like you know HK obviously brought the savagery factor savagery. Savagery. But yeah. <laughs> but they're bringing like glamour, dude. And I think that's tight. I really do. I yeah. see all their stuff like their stories during the week, and I'm like, I've never seen goggles portrayed like this like they, they're bringing the bling bling factor to the well, game well you better it's you better tight. believe i like it me too and you better believe in 50 years when paintball is a multi-million dollar sport these athletes are going to be wearing gold necklaces and diamonds and just flossing out there and just doing the thing have, you know? have like uh bedazzled goggles with, the, with diamond, diamond encrusted <laughs> guns diamond encrusted oh, everything man. You know what I mean? Diamond crusted. I don't know. How do you think LJ feels about that? I'm talking little John, not not to be confused with Justin Schwartz, who's also a, a paintball mm -hmm. superstar. Yeah, yeah. LJ would know. not approve. No, and LJ no. would not approve. No. And I'm, <laughs> no. I'm I'm practical, you know. I got yeah. I got two headbands. I got <laughs> I got one hopper too. If I'm you know usually giving it to Rory. Shout out to Rory Nami Matsu. Yeah, that's Rory. Rory. But, yeah, but like. You know, I, I keep my gear simple because all of that extra gear to me is occupying space in my mind. The less True. I have, I'm like, I want my stuff to work. If I'm going to loan it out to my buddies, I want it to work for him because that's my teammate. And now, you know, that's that's my second gun on the field, right? Mm -hmm. But past yeah. that, like, I'm good. You know, I, I appreciate the anodizing and stuff, especially with like field one forces. Like they're definitely doing some rad anodizing. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't get behind like more than two masks, you know, yeah. unless I... If you're going to collect something cool, why, why not? Why not have it be it's, paintball? I think that's really what it is. It's uh, yeah. it's it's the value because those things are like $500 a piece. Oh, they're I see. Crazy. It blows my mind because yeah. you got to remember, I threw all that stuff away. You know? yeah. I'm, like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, I threw one of those away. I'm like, whatever, man. Yeah, it's worth $200 now. I'm on record saying yeah. I fully support it. Get all the damn masks yeah. you want. Floss yeah. up. Take pictures. Keep in Bling bling, keep baby. In mind, Boss up. <laughs> keep in mind, he is coach of that team, the aforementioned. And I didn't even name drop you. You threw the name out there. Bro. I don't coach them. I don't coach them. Oh, you don't. I no, you I did. don't. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't do feel wrong here. Salsa. No, hundred percent. I I coach the Lords. I think you're thinking the Lords. They're they're kind of similar. They got some friends, but yeah. um, no, uh, LA vibe. I do not coach them. Have not coached them. Mm -mm. Yeah, I will say no that you know, there. definitely. Um, I feel like when I look good, I'm feeling good and I play good, but functionality is functionality is always number one, like knowing your gear, like we talked about here. And then, um, yeah, man, I, I, I have these headbands and like just things that make me feel good. If I, if I'm wearing the right gear, then it makes me feel a certain way and I'm able to play. I, you know, I think it does add something there, you know, a little bit. I was there for the the one on one with Keith, and you had just got a fresh haircut, and I yeah. always wanted to ask you, was that fresh haircut? Because I'd never seen a paintballer get a haircut at the field, <laughs> let alone then win the event. That was yeah. our boy was, Vinny. He's, he's yeah, was Vinny. The, yep. was the fresh haircut a factor in the? Oh, I was I was streamlined. Yeah, I was streamlined out there. Okay, and and honestly, yeah, I was feeling busted as a. <laughs> you know, I just felt busted before I played that. And then I got the haircut and I was feeling really good. So I think it might have helped me a lot. Yeah. The, the, the spidey sense barber. is tingling. Yeah. The spidey sense. You know, when you cut your hair, it kind of does wake up, you know, like the hairs and you can kind of be a little. Yep. He's got the long hair for the YouTube. He's showing <laughs> that. And like you get, um, you know, it's like uh, like the spidey sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I had to ask. Cause yeah, it was, dude. It was the a fresh factor. cut. The fresh cut. That was my first time ever getting a haircut at the paintball field. And Vinny, um, he's such a great guy. Shout out to mm -hmm. Vinny the Barber. Follow him on Instagram. He's got a great page. The um, Edge Barber. Yeah, the, ed the Edge Barber. Edge. And uh, he took care of me. He drove out there and he was like, yeah, let's go. You know, and Matty Boy was there. I think Matty Boy got a haircut too. <laughs> Matty Boy, shout out to him. I saw him that uh, divisional team he's got. I reposted that. Yeah. Uh, I HB actually... Select, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. I uh I met Matty Boy at Jungle Jungle Island Paintball. 
Um, and I did a clinic and this was like years ago. And then I see him, he's big now, you know what I mean? And he was like, he was like, yeah, you, you, I did my first clinic with you like four years ago. I was like, no way. And then it all clicked. Like, dude, I remember you. And his mom sent me a bunch of old pictures of, of us, like at the clinic. I was like, holy crap. And now he's like huge on YouTube. Nice. Huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he, uh, he's a good personality for paintball. Right. And that's mm -hmm. what we talk about. That's, that's also why I'm like with the, you know, 10 masks, I, I think it's cool. You're going to attract, you know, a different group. Cause it's, it's, it is, it's, it's cool. Like it's cool. Yeah. You know, and I'm a big fan of worry about your game first appearance later. I mean, clearly mm -hmm. I've, I've spent so many years looking, I don't care about my headgear too much. I don't it's just never really been my thing. And obviously uh, there's a lot of photos, obviously, obviously of where I look kind of silly. And I'm like, dude, I should care a little bit more. Maybe I would get some more clout, you know, like mouse really yeah. cares how he looks on the field, you know, and he's always looked True. really cool on the field, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I don't know. I've just never, never, I don't know. From, yeah. I remember from day one, I remember asking like Brandon short, what kind of goggles should I wear? You know, on the Ironman. Because I just didn't even know, you know, I had no clue what they were. <laughs> he was the one who gave me the idea for the blue frames that became my signature thing on the Ironman. Yeah, I don't know if you remember on Aftermath, but I had a red frame, right? On yeah, the, the spray painted, the spray painted well, ones. Well, B Short did my red frame for me, and that Whoa. was because we were we were rookie team together, right? From uh, OC kids. Shorty was always like a pioneer in the fashion. 100 percent game yeah 100 percent. no doubt and he, he does a lot of like the cool trendy stuff hk has like short was was yes was already repping before it was totally a thing. absolutely absolutely yeah short was uh short was always ahead of the times on that yeah and yeah. speaking of style we're gonna have gator on here at some point and Hell talk yeah. about nice. all his Hell styles yeah. too because gator it. was one of the sickest i love it man gator was rad i would just say his personality and like the vibe he brought to paintball man it was just Dan's house, man. I don't know how we've been this long. We've been talking for hours. We haven't even talked about Dan's house, the, the HK yeah. rancher, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that's where I first met Gator foot, uh, Mike Bredo, Steve Kwan. Ridiculous. We had this field in Palos Verdes. Uh, Brandon's best friend at the time was, was Dan. And it was a house that we all played. At. It was, it was literally the field of dreams. It was playing paintball sure, in somebody's the field of dreams. Yeah. It was playing paintball in somebody's backyard on like a horse track. It was like a horse, uh, not corral, but like where you train horses mm -hmm. with like beautiful grass. And um, yeah, man, definitely wanted to mention that today. It was a rad, yeah. it was a rad experience that can't ever be brought back. Yeah, it was like the birth of the OC kids. That was like where you guys were all training. I remember it was a cool spot. If you weren't invited to go there and never got to play there, you felt left out. Like that was the, the cool place to be, 100%. It was it was quite literally invite only and not yeah. because, I mean, it was somebody's house. So. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. Wow. That's fantastic. That's cool. Yeah, and all, you know, that's the heritage. That's, uh, that's how we all are sitting here right now is all these amazing stories, you know? That's what it's all about. Absolutely. story time with Derek dude me Rainy. <laughs> I mean I, I'll tell stories all day I don't I don't run out I just I just retell the old ones and then like you know some sort of paintball dementia sends in it's like all right dude we, we've heard it you know this stuff stuff happened after 2005 we get it and I'm like oh oh you mean when I was in Afghanistan sure let's let's yeah. go <laughs> yeah right dude I, yeah. I um I'm telling you now I will be one of the first to uh to, to buy and read your book if uh if it if and when it does come to fruition because yeah, your, stories, your stories it's are happening. yeah exactly exactly i know it is we've talked about it for quite some time now be behind the scenes yeah. um i i'm i'm very interested to see just more of things from your perspective i think it's uh to give a very enlightening way of explaining things um mm -hmm. and and everything that you've been through i think um your outlook is is really unique and special and i think without knowing too much about it or acting like i know too much about it um I think you can have such, and you probably do have such a positive impact on your community, you know, and, and, um, and veterans that are, that are trying to recover from these injuries. Right. And uh, I, I think getting your story out as much as possible and just continuing to do what you do, maybe on like a broader scale is really beneficial for a lot of people, man. Um, I think you're kind of a unicorn to, to go through that kind of stuff. Yeah. You're, you're right. You know, yeah. seriously, man. I mean, the shirt, the shirt, makes it easy to say that for all the listeners <laughs> go on the YouTube. Yeah. He's got a, a very tie dye shirt going on violent hippie shout out. I know uh, you said your boy hooked up with that shirt. Pretty cool. Violent hippies. Um, no, but seriously, man, I think, uh, I think that's, that's a tough thing, man. I can't imagine, you know, you go to war and you, you see and deal and have to go through some 
some really brutal things and to come back and, and kind of feel alone. It seems like you're, you're extending your, your arm and trying to do your best to, to help people in that situation. And that I think is, uh, that's life's work right there. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you can continue that, that's, that's something to hang your hat up on and, um, and be really proud of. So, um, I want to hear more about it. I, I definitely want Absolutely. to get going on this book. I want to get that out there and, um, anything we can do to help facilitate that and promote it. A um, million percent. We're, we're here for that, brother. Oh, you guys are. And you, you already asked the hard questions, you know, like it's not, it's not easy for me to talk about quitting hell week. Cause like the whole thing of being a seal has never quit, but I'm like, well, I did it, you know, and that mm-hmm, sucked, yeah. but it's, it's therapy to get it out, you know? And, and mm-hmm. the cool thing about the triple threat program that I'm a part of now is everybody in there is a combat veteran. So like I said, a lot of these times when you're a world champion paintballer, right? You have a very small network of other world champion paintballers that you can talk to. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same way with combat veterans. Like you don't have a lot of other people that you can share these stories with where they have the IQ, they have the, the nomenclature to, and even just, I guess, I guess we're going to use clout as the right word here, but the repertoire to like swap those stories, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, when you have a community of people you can sit around with, and like I said, we literally have a Vietnam vet here and it just, it blows my mind, man. Every dude in that room has either been blown up or been shot at or engaged in and every dude in the room. So, and sometimes it's mm-hmm. packed and you're just like, man, crazy. It blows my mind. Like every time I go, like, I, I love it. And it's all about the tribe, right? We, we, we brought this up earlier, but um, humans need to be a part of a tribe oh. and, and we have to have that community, you know? 100%. Yeah. If you're into like uh, philosophy or um, like psychology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You need yes. food, water, shelter. The next thing you need that not a lot of people talk about is community. Mm-hmm. Uh, you need you need somebody to talk to, somebody to like be like, hey, you're a human, I'm a human. Like, let's talk. Mm-hmm. Like, I got I got some stuff going on in this this part up here that doesn't quite feel right with what's happening here, but I know that you feel it too. Somehow we yeah. just know that about each other. And um, what he was saying back- is up for the for the listeners he was saying up in his you know up in the head and then in the heart as well yeah right yeah they're two different engines in my opinion two different engines and you're gonna follow one or the other but what you want really is you want to both sing and in harmony you want Mm -hmm. the heart and the head to be driving that same sled same direction you want to know that what you're waking up to do today is what your heart feels good doing not just like what's going to make money and not just what's going to impress people but what feels right in the heart oh man couldn't have said that any better that that's spot on yeah and uh it's so important that we you know we build that tribe and that community and i think paintball is a tremendous community and we're all so fortunate to be a part of that tribe it's done so much for all of our lives i know that it's a it's an amazing thing absolutely brother my man yeah. Derek, we're approaching three hours here man i think uh i know dude, we, I, we blew through that yeah, yeah I, I think that was we fun could- we could probably talk for days. I, I, you know, maybe, maybe we'll just have to have you back on, but, um, yeah. Where can, where can listeners keep up with you and follow? I know you get, you, you did shout out your Instagram already, but you know, one more time, where yeah, can everybody Instagram, keep up with you? To- um, the oath movement. And then also Ryan Martin's Instagram. I'm going to, I'm going to tag him cause he's okay. my business partner. Ryan's okay. been literally my, my OG homie since 2003. Um, yeah. Hit up Ryan. Right, uh, Ryan's the man. Ryan, Ryan is is such a solid rock of mine as a friend because there's so many times in my life where I was I was, was kind of out of it, man. I was in a rough mm-hmm. spot, and he was always there for me, like from paintball, from relationships. So yeah. Ryan deserves all that. I, I always say Ryan did his deployment just by being my friend, but Ryan <laughs> wow. will never take credit for being a veteran because he didn't he didn't serve, but he served like vicariously through our friendship, in my opinion. Yeah, he's a great and dude. It, if you don't think Ryan's ready for war, you're tripping. Cause I, I taught him how to shoot and then, and I grew up fighting with him. So mm-hmm. Ryan, Ryan's a Patriot. And I think we need more Patriots in, in this day and age. It's, it's kind of a dying breed in, in, in some aspects of our society. Mm. Yeah. Well, from the bottom of my heart, man, I just want to say thank you. And thank you to the armed forces, all everybody out there um, who is laying it on the line for all of us to, to be living in America and living comfortably as much as many things as, as, you know, we gripe about, we need to be grateful, you know, we need yeah, to be grateful for where we're at. Shout out to, to Grandpa Harmon, man. Harmon's don't quit, right? So yeah, the keep, Harmon's keep don't that quit. Strong. <laughs> That's it, I'm brother. Appreciate you guys. Quit, baby. <laughs> I love appreciate that. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you, Derek. Yeah. I'll bring down some, tra- me on. some transfuse, heel brand, stuff like that. I'll bring some, yep. da- some stuff down soon. You're close to me, man. So we got to meet up for some lunch. Close. Sounds good, dude.
All right. Thank you for everything, brother. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Wow, that was just a spectacular episode. I, I mean, that, that might be one of the best episodes we've had, truly, uh, to have that perspective and that discussion with somebody um, decorated as a Navy SEAL, uh, one of my you know longtime friends, someone that I looked up to as a kid. Really special for him to come on and share those stories with you guys. PTG fam, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys uh, learn from it and, and are able to take away you know a lot of valuable lessons. If you guys would like, you can head over to ptgpaintball.com, support the show, become a uh, you know supporter, and make sure you guys follow Derek. You know, first and foremost, actually, I don't even really want to to plug our PTG stuff. Let's promote and and uh, support Derek uh, on on this one. So you guys can head over find him on Instagram and his website. He gave you guys you know all the details in the show. So please just go uh, show some support. And um, as always, we're gonna see you very soon. We'll have another episode out here in the near future. All right, peace.